maybe wanting to come over. Or a time delay. Way. Uh -huh. This way, yeah. There we so go. So you can bleep out anything. Yeah. There's a delay. Let's see. There it is. Yeah. Wow, it's lighting. Okay. Yeah. All right. Five <laughs> Hi everybody. Uh, hopefully you can hear us. Um, we're here. We're going to be live today uh, for our live auction. And I had a lot of people ask me about the. Uh, All right. Uh, Hi everybody. Uh, hopefully you can hear us. Um, we're here. We're going to be live today uh, for our live auction. And I had a lot of people ask me about the. Uh, All right. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, you have to turn the sound off on that. It was going to be a live auction, but um, you know, I guess um, you know, I was growing up, and the way that we raised money is we watched Jerry Lewis Telethon on the TV, and uh, you know, kind of dating uh, myself a little bit with that. If you know, if you know what uh, Jerry Lewis Telethon is, and so I kind of wanted to put something together that was like that, so that we could raise some much needed funds for our baby season because right now we are just getting slammed with babies early, um, early um, you know I was telling someone yesterday that I used to be able to have till about Memorial Day uh, before a lot of the babies come in and you know the weather has just gotten crazier and crazier uh, and speaking of weather um, we have some crazy weather today uh, we're expecting tornadoes uh, in the area so we're going to do the best we can with the, what we have, and um, and hopefully the weather doesn't bother us. But, you know, with the weather being crazy like it is, babies are starting to come in now as early as February. And instead of being done in uh, August, uh, we're going into September, I think, last year. would have been the beginning of October. All October, almost into November, we're still getting babies. And what that means for us is... Uh, it's a lot more work. It doubles the workload. Uh, we have to hire a lot of people in the baby season to keep up with the workload. We need more interns. We, we actually need more staff. Um, the babies have feedings going on between uh, anywhere from every 10 minutes, 14 hours a day, to um, some of them, you know, they start as they get older, they go into 30 minutes and uh, an hour and whatnot, but we do have babies pretty much the entire time that eat every 10 or 15 minutes the entire day. So, um, you know, that has added a lot of increased cost for us, and so we're hoping, um, you know, to run this fundraiser today and get to know uh, you guys and have you get to meet our staff. And um, and um, and I, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Jennifer Gordon. And I'm the director for the rescue, and I have with me uh, Laurel Malachi. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, um, in my main function is uh, running the baby bird program. And uh, basically through now, through October, um, we take in all these little birds, whether they're injured or healthy or whatever their circumstance. Uh, day like today and high winds will probably mean more nests and babies coming in tomorrow and the next day. Um, so we're very aligned with what happens with the weather, of course, and uh, they come in, they're looked at, and then we feed them and, and take care of them until they grow to fledge, and which is anywhere from six weeks to eight weeks, depending on when they come in and the type of bird, and we're constantly getting more through the season, so it's constantly birds in, birds out, <laughs> as soon as we can get them out, um, so that they can get back into nature and do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. So. So that's a lot of work. It may sound like it's easy when she's talking about it, but it is a lot of work. Um, you know, we have to run, um, I think at there, I'm not sure how many volunteers we have this year. We haven't gotten fully up and running yet, but uh, in previous years, it takes almost 400 people to run our baby bird program. That's with all the volunteers and the interns and staff. Um, I think we uh, usually get in over uh, over 3,000 baby birds alone. That doesn't include the other wildlife that we take in. That's just the baby birds. So, um, you know, 3,000 little tiny mouths uh, to feed, and that costs us generally on average about $50 per bird. And so um, that's 
That's okay. why we're uh, hoping, we were hoping to get this uh, live auction out of the way before babies started coming in and they, they sort of started trickling in <laughs> and I told everybody, I said, they don't just, they don't trickle in, you get like one or two well, and, then, boom, and yeah. then it's like a ton of bricks drops on us and the ton of bricks has dropped. We are overflowing with babies uh, already. Um, we're, we're scrambling to prep and get ready. Uh, now we're just trying to raise some funds for that. So um, today what we're going to do is try to entertain you a little bit and we're going to have some presentations throughout the day. I posted a schedule earlier uh, showing what times that people will be coming on to talk about different things. We have our veterinarian here today. Uh, she's going to do a Q&A live. So if you have questions for Marianne, uh, we have some people doing presentations on snakes, uh, parrots, um, we have a couple different other animals coming up. What, what am I missing? Um, um, goats, uh, turkey, rabbit. uh, rabbits. So we're, we're yeah. going to showcase animals that we have for adoption. We're going to let you meet some of our residents and we're going to highlight some of the really cool items that are in our auction that may have been overlooked. Um, because we hand catalog everything ourselves and so we're, we know what all the really neat and cool <laughs> stuff is so we want to share that with you guys and uh, let you see some of the really um, interesting items that people have donated for this auction and I think Stephanie uh, will be here to talk about the regular auction and um, a little bit about how that works so that you can um, get an idea of what other things are going on here. I got a piece of hair in my mouth. <laughs> So I guess um, we do we have some auction items that we can um, show you guys real quick before we get started. So we had someone donate some really cool purses. Um, I don't think this one has it yet. Um, and I honestly uh, don't know anything about purses. I know I'm, I'm a girl, but um, I don't. Pretty. I don't really know a lot about what purses are what, so if it looks nice, this one still has the new plastic on it and everything. We haven't had any, I don't think we've had any bids on this one. It's an Iron Man purse. We got a couple other ones. Now this one, this one, like I said, I don't know anything about purses. It's real cute though. But this is really cute and um, obviously uh, the black and the white and red, those are my colors. <laughs> so um, this one is... What is this? It's a Liz Claiborne bag. It's still new. It's got the brand new tag on it. And it was originally priced at $75 and somebody donated that. It's even got the little, a little package still in there. So these are brand new bags that um, I don't think have gotten a lot of bids yet. This is a, a, a used bag, but it's a coach bag. Um, nice color and um, I don't know. I don't know what the value of this is. Like I said, I'm not a purse person. Um, I just I'm a backpack from Walmart that I carry around. <laughs> but because in this job, what I'm doing a lot of times is um, we're actually um, I I don't know. You probably can't see it on me from the camera, but my entire body is covered with wounds right now because we were leaving the other day and we had um, I spotted a goose down in the road up here and uh, all of us just jumped in the truck and went down to get him out of the road. I don't know how he got out. He couldn't um, fly really and he went up into the berm mm. which is full of blackberry bushes. So he went in the berm, I went in the berm and um, when I got home I had to pluck um, uh, thorns out of my whole body and I didn't even realize till I got in the shower that um, it was on every part of my body, my legs and everything. So. You know, that's, that comes with the territory around here with our job. Um, if animals go in the water, I go in the water. If they go in the bushes, I go in the bushes. And so, um, I don't know about other people, but my adrenaline kicks in and I don't, I don't even realize that I'm uh, getting stuck. Uh, I'm fo so focused on the animals and getting them safety. So, um, I definitely look like I got chicken pox or something right now. <laughs> but that's one reason why, you know, I, I, I don't want to ruin something expensive so I just I don't spend money on things like that but um, the, these are in there this is a bicentennial coin collection and it's actually um, I, I looked it up and I found a lot of different values on it but we have two we have this bigger collection and we have a smaller one 
and these have never been opened or circulated. If you're into coins, those are in our auction. And then um, we have a lot of jewelry. So I, I, I go for all the nostalgic stuff like these, these little clip earrings. They remind me of my grandma. Mm. And you know, this stuff is back in style, the vintage stuff again. So um, we have stuff like this. Um, I don't know if that has any bids on it either. I need to get update this morning on what actually has bids on it. I know this because this is the lizard pin. I have my eye on that. Mm. <laughs> I think it's actually a vintage pin, but it's really cute. It's got little, um, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes, but it's got little, you know, um, cuts on here that almost look like diamonds, you know, so you can see it kind of makes his back glimmer a little bit. It's, it's all just one piece of metal. I think it's pewter or something like that, but um, I like pins and I like lizards. So, okay, $5? Yep. Okay. So that one does have bids on it already. This one, um, somebody asked me about this. I posted a picture of it earlier and someone was like, oh, where's that at? It's a really cool, oh, that's cool necklace too. And I don't think we've got any bids on it. That's really pretty. It's really pretty. So I know we don't want to bore you all day with this kind of stuff, but we will have some more things out later. Um, I'm going to pull some of my favorite things out and um, let's get this out of the way. And I actually, in case you haven't noticed, there's some snakes right here. So okay, I'm going to show you a couple of snakes. I was going to do a thing with the uh, snake puppet, but my, my person uh, couldn't come today last minute that was going to do the puppet show. So you don't get to uh, hear me make fake snake hissing noises. <laughs> but it's very cute though. <laughs> but he's very cute. All right. So anybody that knows me, obviously if you follow the rescue, you know that we love snakes. I love snakes. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that because not only if the babies are coming in, we also have um, a lot of reptiles coming out. Uh, starting to get in the road. I think this we had two huge snapping turtles that came in that were both hit by cars. Um, the turtles are out guys so please uh, make sure that you're looking at the road when you're driving uh, with all the rain too. That usually brings some of the reptiles out and um, soon as the uh, soon as the sun comes out they need to get warm and the first place they go is the road. So please be really careful and be looking out for our reptile friends on the road. So we've had a resident, um, um, we have a resident corn snake named Sam. Uh, she's 18. Um, she's recently found to, um, we noticed her appetite was decreasing. So we put her um, uh, up for a vet exam and realized that she had a lot of arthritis. And so she's been on a pain management program. Oops, where are you going? And um, we decided because of her arthritis that we weren't going to use her for programs anymore because it's uncomfortable for her to be carried around and you know i always feel like things happen for a reason and as soon as uh we had made the decision about sam to retire her we got this little lady in and so we decided to keep her as a resident um our new resident corn snake and we like to do programs about snakes we don't actually get corn snakes in this area um, but they are native to North Carolina they're found in a lot of places the reason they are actually named corn snakes is because uh, people usually find them in the corn cribs uh, where rodents are found you will find snakes and um, speaking of where rodents are found and where you find snakes snakes are getting into people's houses already and the reason for that is mostly um, if you do have rodents, you will, you will attract snakes to your house. So the best way to keep snakes out is to also make sure that you're keeping rodents uh, from, um, from your house. And if you have piles of, of brush and different things in your yard, uh, that's a good hiding place for food, which means you're going to find snakes. Um, we uh, only have one venomous snake in this area which is not the case in a lot of areas around North Carolina, but if you live in the Charlotte area, uh, the only venomous snake we have really is a copperhead. 
the um, range for the rattlesnakes uh, is usually down more towards the coast or the mountains, and we don't really get um, the cotton mouse here either. There isn't a habitat up here for them to breed. It doesn't mean that there might not be a rare sighting, but everything, um, water snakes, baby rat snakes, everyone thinks they're copperheads. Um, and we offer a free um, snake relocation service. You just text our hotline, which is 704-286-6330, and you can send a photo of the snake and with the issue you're having, and we will tell you what kind of snake it is. And if you determine that uh, it needs to be relocated, we, we help you with that. Um, depending on how busy we are, but we also have a team of other uh, relocators that we work with, and we'll do our best to make sure that we can help you with the snake, but I think most of the issues with the snakes is that people are just not educated about them, and once they realize um, the benefits that they're doing, I can usually talk most people into leaving the snakes alone. So, um, it's kind of hard to get her on the camera because she is small and she doesn't want to stop moving, but... Um, She's so pretty though. But the best thing you can do for about identifying snakes is to learn the patterns. There's a lot of um, myths and sayings and old wives tales about snakes that um, just aren't true. And um, you know, they say like, look at the pupils. If the pupils are round, um, that means it's non-venomous. And that isn't true either because uh, venomous snakes do have elliptical pupils, but their eyes dilate just like yours do with different varying light conditions. And if the light is really bright, um, you're going to have uh, round pupils on a copperhead, so you don't want to go by that. Um, there's a couple other things like, you know, red touches yellow, kill a fellow, or whatever that saying is, and um, that's not always true either. So the best thing to do is just to learn your patterns. The head shape is another misconception. Um, also, this snake, if this snake was... Um, the snake was upset she would flatten her head out and make it look like a venomous snake and she would also rattle her tail so she would come up and do the tail rattling um, usually what they'll do is get in some leaves or they'll get against something so that when they rattle um, it sounds like a rattlesnake and they do that because um, most predators in the wild if they know it's a rattlesnake they go okay stay away from the snake I don't want to get bit well as humans, we, we obviously know we hear a rattlesnake, the first thing we think is, oh, let's kill whatever this is. And so snakes um, don't necessarily know that when they make that noise that it's, it's going to cause harm for them because it confuses people and they think it's a rattlesnake. So I read a study, um, and I, I'll try to post the link in it, but I read a study about how um, rattlesnakes actually, the, the whole purpose of the rattle is because snakes want to see you less than you want to see them. So when you come across a rattlesnake, the only reason he rattles his tail is he's just saying, hey, I don't want you to get hurt, so I'm letting you know I'm here because I don't, I, I, I don't want to get hurt. But this one study that I was reading is snakes are actually evolving to adapt to the that when they do rattle they just get killed and so some of them are not rattling anymore to warn us that they're there because they know that when they do that they get killed so um, it's kind of sad when you look at it that way is, is that they're trying to tell us they're there so that they don't they don't hurt you and they just want to get away from us and um, they have to stop trying to help us because we uh, don't help them so um, just kind of text us. We're happy to help you with snakes. Let's put this one back. She can go back to her nice warm cage. And then I'm going to pull out Reggie. So Reggie is um, a ball python. And we actually do have snakes here for adoption. So we want to talk a little bit about um, the snakes that we have for adoption. And um, so we don't, we don't have a lot of snakes for adoption right now. We think we have pending adoptions for um, the, the boa constrictor and for, I think Reggie actually goes to a home next week. So Reggie's an older ball python. He's a little bit bigger. 
And so this is snake that is not native to our area. These are kept in the pet trade. Uh, people do turn them loose and in an area around here, he probably wouldn't survive. We do get them, people have just turned them outside. Um, they're sort of a tropical snake. Um, they come from different areas not native to here where they're in a warm climate all the time. This snake has to be sort of kept in a warm climate. But we do get them outside. They will die outside uh, when it gets cold. They don't really have the ability to, um, to stay warm in that regard unless we live. That's why in Florida they have all these non-native snakes taking over because down there they'll do really well but up here they don't they don't thrive well so um, Reggie was an owner surrender which happens <laughs> frequently when people can't keep pets but um, what time is it um, 11 30 so we should have um, your baby you guys are Thanks. doing the baby bird okay so we um, like I think um, I'll finish up and then we'll switch over but anyway, if you're interested in a snake, um, we have snakes like Reggie. We get ball pythons really frequently. And um, this is another one of the animals that we have that often needs a home. And I think my time is up for snake talk. So I'm gonna um, scooch, I'll scooch out and you can come down and um, we'll let Laurel and Stephanie are gonna talk a little bit about um, the whole baby bird program, the whole baby bird program, and, and volunteering and whatever else. <laughs> so let me get this guy out of here. We'll go put these guys back in their warm enclosures. All right, I'm gonna slide out and let you guys take over. Miranda is one of our volunteers, and she's also staff now, but she's been feeding baby birds for how long? About six years now. Yeah, so she's a pro, and um, it's always great when she walks in, because I know I've got somebody who can handle anything like yesterday in finches. Yes. So, um, so the baby bird program, um, we're kind of changing things around a little bit this year. Um, we want everybody to understand what we do basically before they arrive to volunteer. So this year we're asking that if anybody is new, um, email volunteer at cwrescue.org. And Angie, um, who will be our pirate person later on, will um, send you a, uh, some paperwork that you need to fill out. And once you return that, we're going to send you some baby bird um, instructional videos. This uh, over the winter time, we um, we filmed a bunch of videos that I think will help people understand exactly what we do. Because um, along with feeding, we also to do a lot of cleaning and, and maintenance on the birds. So in order to fledge healthy birds, and they not only have to be fed on a certain interval depending on the bird and the age and the, the type of bird, but they also have to be kept clean. And that's many times a day changing out pillowcases. That's um, uh, making sure that the bird themselves are clean, their feet are clean, there's no poop on them, food is off them. So it's, it's a whole process of things. And we have a very organized system in, in the baby bird room, so everybody kind of learns the system and, and it works really well. Um, once you see the videos, then I do ask that you come in for an orientation, and I'm happy to do that pretty much. I will run that throughout the season. I've had some um, of late but I can pretty much, since I'm there all the time, I can, you know, be pretty adaptable to fit you in when, I, when I'm there. So this way you can get a real sense of what we do before you, to make sure that it's something that you do want to do. Because um, there are many volunteer opportunities at the, um, at the rescue. So many choices. And a lot of, uh, last year, a lot of our baby bird feeders um, wound up working shift at the rescue, so did a lot of yeah. night work. Um, and a lot of 
and um, so there's uh, that they morph from babies and they start to do other things. So it's great, and we appreciate that. Um, so once we get you signed up, then we have um, you'll let me know what shift we I do ask if you can do a recurring shift so that we can have a really tight schedule and everybody knows who's coming in. You let me know if you can't make it. I have people back up for, um, you know, in the waiting in the wings if you can't. So we just try to have it so that everybody has the most positive experience and no one's left hanging with just by themselves on a shift or anything like that. Because it is, we are time sensitive. We have a lot of birds um, and everybody needs to be fed in the time interval. And when, June, July, August rolls around, we have hundreds and hundreds of birds in the baby bird building, and that probably means about four to five people that are needed each shift in order to get everybody fed and cleaned um, within that time frame. Um, so in addition to, um, I'll do a little bit on this before we go into the babies, but um, there's a lot of other opportunities for volunteering at the rescue. Um, if you're a person who likes to be out and meet people and talk about the rescue and um, sort of tell everyone what we do, we do a lot of events, especially in the summertime. We do a lot of festivals. We do, um, we're invited to many, many places. Um, so we always need a couple of people who set up a table and can talk about what we do. Sometimes it's uh, selling some merchandise that we have. Um, just mainly getting our word out so that we can attract uh, volunteers as well as donors because as a 501c3 um, we live by the donations that we get so such as the auction you know we do these things because it's it, it brings in revenue for for us and that's you know greatly needed um, to, to in order to feed and take care of everything uh, that we do here um, we have uh, coming up quite a few uh, corporate work days. So that's another way that some, perhaps if you uh, work for a company that's interested in helping a nonprofit, uh, that's something that you could reach out to us for. Um, we have several companies coming, uh, one of which has a lot of handy skills. Uh, they're a, a, a building company, so we'll be glad to have their um, tools and their, their know-how that day, but we will take anybody and there's always um, uh, things that we need done here, some repairs, some painting, all different kinds of things, and we love when people can come. Um, we also do other events, um, such as um, we're having a golf event on April 17th, um, a Monday at uh, Pine Lake Country Club in Mint Hill, and that's another way that we're hoping to raise money for um, um, the things that we do so we have on on our website we have the link to sign up for that um, if you're not sure of the people that um, you're bringing you can always um, oh, here, buddy. Um, you can you can let me know later and uh, but the main thing is we'd love to have as many people as possible to attend and again that's Monday April 17th in uh, Mint Hill um, one thing we did just find out about, save the date for July 21st, it's a Friday, at Birdsong Brewery, uh, we are going to be the Spotlight um, Charity that day, and um, we will get um, a revenue from every beer sold between uh, noon and 11 p.m. that day, and we actually will be there in the evening. So there's a lot of opportunities. We try to do different things, and that sounds like a really fun event. Um, so, baby birds. Um, this year we um, made up, I found a baby bird, um, what do I do? Um, we can go through a little bit of that, but I think what we'll do first is do some true and false questions, which people always ask. Um, so a definite question is, will bird parents uh, abandon their nest if you move, try to move them or if they scent, uh, scent of a human is on the baby if you pick it up or not? So. Do you think that's true or false? And the answer, answer is actually false. That's like an old wives' tale. The, the the desire to raise their young is so strong in animals that they will they will that will not deter them from coming back if at all possible. If they're injured, if they can't, that's a different story. But you can um, re-nest them. So if one falls out of the nest and you can get to the nest, please put it back in. It has the best chance of survival if it's with the parents. Um, 
Uh, and also renesting is something that you can do as long as you have something that's uh, porous, meaning like a Easter egg basket that uh, water will build in it or water will come through. You can actually put part of the nest in something else and put it in that location and birds will come back to there. It doesn't have to be just their nest. Um, again, a day like today with a lot of rain and potential wind later, that's when nests fail and that's the opportunity perhaps if you do have the babies you can make you know make up your own nest and put it back in that location so that's something you can do um bird parent do bird parents recognize their young's crying will they come and they call um is that true or false so that that's actually true um they will hear their own they'll know their own babies and they will come uh, along as long as you know they're within uh, within reach so it's it's they do recognize their own so um, and they will come back so that's part of the reason for renesting again is because um, if you can possibly get them into the same area within a, a small radius you will be able to um, they'll be able to come back and take care of their babies um, should I keep my pets away from a known songbird nesting area uh, true or false? Yes. Um, and the main culprit is cats. Um, people have outdoor cats, feral cats are, are tough, but if you have a pet cat and you know you have a nest, if you can keep it away from there, that would be great because we get so many um, baby birds as well as adults are injured by cats. And unfortunately, cats, as they dig in their litter and um, they're, they carry all kinds of bacteria on their, on their claws and on their mouth, and sometimes um, when the babies come in, we have to give them um, antibiotics right away, but if we don't catch it early enough, it's, it's a death sentence for them and they'll pass. Even though they look fine, they'll, they'll pass. I know, yeah. So that's really important. You keep your dog on a leash if you know there's a, a birds around, or please um, keep your cat inside uh, or monitor where they are if they're outside. Um, he doesn't like the cats, he said. Oh, I can understand that. <laughs> um, are all vets uh, able to rehabilitate wildlife or an injured bird? And the answer to that actually is false because like with doctors, there's a great amount of specialization in veterinary care. And um, most vets are in dogs and cats and, and house pets, but um, most do not work on wildlife. So yeah, that's something also have to be licensed for a while. For live life. So, so it's a whole other process for them. They would have to specialize it and go through a whole different process. So that's why it's important. Contact us. We can always give you guidance on something like that if it cannot be brought in here. So would we you like talk about Zeke? Yeah. Well, look at the cutest little rooster. So he's is he retired from his um, activities? Yes, he's also retired. He's he's a one of our oldest residents now, and um, he's getting old like us and getting a little arthritis. <laughs> so let's put him, in, you can see him, yeah. Yeah, you can see him. Yeah. Can I see him? He's got gorgeous colors. <laughs> he's so handsome. So he's in a retirement coop now with his ladies, mm -hmm. and we have this super cute video of him. Um, there's a red rooster that looks just like him. Oh, yeah, they saw. <laughs> comes to see and he jumps up and tries to get as tall as he can so that he um, he looks big like the other rooster because he's a big rooster and a small body. Yeah. A very <laughs> small body. Yeah. He's maybe, I would say about a foot and maybe a couple of inches tall. He's not big at all. <laughs> no, he's, a, he's, a, he's so sweet. been with us a long time. So, but yeah, he doesn't really go out in the public anymore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not much bigger than the coffee you cup. You can't really yeah. see the coffee cup, I don't think. Yeah. Well, there's a delay. Yeah, yeah. there's a delay, but it'll So see. it's him next to a coffee cup. They're about the same size. <laughs> He's like, well, I'm going to look for some food. food here. Do you think yeah. that's a worm? Yeah. It looks like a worm. Tell us a little bit about the monthly auction, because Stephanie actually works on the auction. What do you, um, tell us a little bit about what you do with that, Stephanie. Yeah, so we get um, lots of donations from um, everywhere, from folks um, far and wide, actually, uh, to put in our monthly auction, which normally runs 
from the 1st of every month to the 15th. Um, it ends on the 15th at 6.59 and 59 seconds, uh, exactly, um, every month. And um, we just post all those items, um, folks bid on them, um, and actually other people uh, will post their own items in the auction as well. So that's a, a little bit of a different format than what we're having here. Uh, today, so that's um, actually kind of nice. The interaction with most of the um, all of the members on the on the auction site is really great. There's been some great friendships forged there. Um, everyone is really kind um, to each other, and um, yeah. So it just started today. We already have a few items up um, by our wonderful donors, uh, Cindy Hallam. She's fantastic great supporter of the rescue um, and I think there's a couple of other items and I can't remember who posted them I'm sorry guys but um, do you have any of those knitted uh, toys this month yes I will be posting um, quite a few of the crochet items we got donated from uh, Cindy um, it's Cindy strings on Facebook and I can't remember her name it's Cynthia Cressman um, so she, she sends in some amazing crocheted, handmade um, stuffed animals, um, and they do really, really well. They're, they're really well made and beautiful. Um, she also makes other items. We have a, a, so many talented people in the group who donate their time and items um, for donations. So it, it's really a great community there. So it started today, so if you guys... Uh, Anybody interested in it, uh, just look for it on Facebook. It's um, CWR Auction, Auction or Auctions. I can't remember, I should know I that. just posted a link in there. Okay, the perfect. So Jennifer just posted the link in the chat, so it, it's there if anyone wants to go there as well and check, check out what we have this month. <laughs> there goes Zeke. There goes Zeke. So, and uh, I think in about, we're, we have about 10 minutes left, and then we're going to do uh, par a talk with parents. All right. This is awesome. Do the, um, yeah, the pic pictures? Yeah, sure. we, we have a little um, show and tell, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Well, besides Zeke. Maybe Zeke will guess. Maybe Zeke will guess. See if you can guess. Huh. <laughs> so, um... We'll show a picture here. I don't know how well you can actually see the picture, but we're going to show you pictures of baby birds. And oh yeah, that's perfect. And then you can try to guess. Anybody in the comments can guess what those might be. Does anybody know what these are? Oh here, they're early breeders. They breed basically once, and they'll be pouring in any moment. Okay. Are we ready to guess? I think I. Trying to get it to where it's centered. There we yeah, go. Do you have any guesses? All right, Jeffrey said robins. No. no. That's a good guess. Good guess, though. It's hard to tell with the babies. Here's what it is. That is an European starling. European starling. All right, what's next? Okay, let's see. Um, that one's an easy one. Yeah. This is a real common bird. I'll tell you a story about this bird without telling you what it is. When my uh, son was a baby, he said, you know, I have a bird that follows me everywhere I go. And I said, really? And he said, yes, this bird everywhere I go, he's there. And it's, you know, he's a kid, but the, it's actually a really common bird and he's seeing the bird everywhere. Well, I told him, I said, that's that bird's your guardian, guardian angel. He's going to follow you everywhere you go. Um, and so everywhere my son goes, he sees this bird and, um, and it's a mockingbird. So, uh, the mockingbird's been his guardian angel since he was a little boy. Um, and it obviously, now that he's older, he realizes that it's not the same bird, but a couple times, <laughs> a couple times in his life, he's actually seen the bird when he needed to know someone was there. And I think it's kind of a cool little story, but the mockingbird has been his guardian angel and it was the first bird I raised uh, oh, wow. when I became a rehabilitator. It was the first songbird I raised yeah. and so I'm kind of really partial to them. Your first baby's always, always, um, yeah. always special, right? 
So this is, uh, let's give them some really hints. Common one. Common one. It's a very common bird. Um, the, 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 um, it's a state bird. The, the adults are sexually dimorphic, which means that they're uh, male and the females. You can tell them apart by features, in this case, of uh, its colors. Does anybody have a guess? Is anybody guessing? We all know we're all raising <laughs> yeah, We all know we're all raising our hands. You know. <laughs> this was also my grandma's favorite bird. Mm -hmm. So uh, I grew up with cardinals all over my grandma's house, and she has um, uh, the cardinals. I'm waiting for it to yeah, show up. Jeffrey There's... got it right. He said yeah. cardinals. All right, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. So this one is... Oh, it's another common one. So, if you're, if you live around here, you've had this bird in your house, probably, <laughs> yeah. or your garage. That's what you have in yeah. your house. Yeah. They're in my house all the time. If you're on my friends list, you watch the video, you will see this bird nesting in my house. Anytime the door is left open, I, I leave, I let the dog out and that bird is in. He wants to, he wants to be in the house. Um, but, um. And this bird, what's another hint? Um, they're oh, they're the ones Jeffrey that said Ryan. Yeah, yeah, good job. So Jeffrey. someone's got it. These How are the are birds you? that because they get in your house, they're often found on glue traps. Yeah. Um, sure. These are the number one bird we get in on a glue trap because people. Um, and this is a Carolina wren. So this is the favorite bird of a lot of people that I know. Mm -hmm. They are also sexually dimorphic, so the male and the female looks different, although the female is just a little um, little less bright colored as this one. Yep. What else? These, uh, they're famous for eating mealworms, mm -hmm. I think. Yes. A lot of people like to put out feeders for and these guys. And houses, too. And houses. I'm trying to think, what else can we say? <laughs> the, the color of the bird is in its name. Mm -hmm. Any guesses? Come on, Jeffrey. We're counting on. on you, Jeffrey. Come on. <laughs> Jeffrey said bluebird. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I couldn't say blue or it gives it away. Yeah, yeah. it just gives it There's away. only two birds, I think, that have blue, and that's blue jay and, and blue, blue bird. Yeah. Yep. So... Many. <laughs> many. So this is a super common Lots. bird. We get a lot a lot of birds. This bird often succumbs to um, the conjunctivitis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the main carriers of that when you get a feeder um, and you see a bird that's sick, it's usually this one. Um, they're also sexually dimorphic. There's two types of this bird. One has more color and then this one has a little less color. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, what else can we say? He has the pretty typical conical beak um, of a seed eater bird. Um, they are also the ones that nest in your wreath, mm -hmm. on your door. So, uh, let me see. And early and often. Uh, a non-native <laughs> domesticated version of this bird is often kept as pets. Jeffrey said house finches. All, All right. right. He's got it. There you go. I think we're out of time okay. um, to start. What time is it? Yes, uh, it is 11:52. Okay. Well, we have a few more minutes. Let's do one. Let's do a couple more. Okay. Just let me know when we're when we're getting up there. All right. Oops. Oops. Almost okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this one. So in general, birds with these with these giant cherry red mouths are the ones that are more likely to overeat. So when we're feeding these guys, <laughs> there's a couple of them like this. Um, finches are also one of them that no matter, um, a lot of birds, they eat till they're full and then they go to sleep. And there's a couple of birds that no matter what you do, they will make you think they're starving to death. And so that, that's an issue with an inexperienced person trying to raise a bird because they will overfeed them. Actually, um, you can overfeed them, um, pretty bad. Oops. So. Oh. Sorry. Anybody take a guess on this one? So this this is a, a bird that is actually related to crows. Super smart. Super smart bird. One of the most beautiful birds in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's also brightly colored. Um, I'm trying to think what else we can say. He's a little bigger than regular birds. They're not dimorphic. I don't think. No. 
Um, let's see. I think they can actually talk and when raised in captivity, but I'm trying to think. What else can we say about this bird? He also has the color, his color uh, in his name, which kind of gives it away because I just said there's only two with this um, in there, but I'm going to go ahead and just show you because we're getting out of time. So uh, Jeffrey and Jasmine said blue jay. Blue jay. Oh, yeah. there you go. There's the blue jay. All right, and this one. Okay, this is an overeater. So when we're talking about overeating, this is the bird that overeats right here. These are nomadic birds. Their nesting habits are parasitic. Uh -huh. So they, a lot of people don't like them. And you can see the bird we're talking about is here. So this is a bird in with other birds. And these are native birds. So a lot of people don't like them because um, the, the reason that they're actually, um, they, they nest in another bird's nest is because they follow migration of other animals and that's their food source. So what they do, because they can't stay in an area long enough to raise their babies, they have to put their baby in the nest of another bird. And then they travel around with their food source, which most, most animals breed and travel around with their food sources. But this bird is often villainized over the habits of how it has to raise its family, but it doesn't have a choice. Um, the animal that it travels is in its name with so the the herds that it follows does anybody All have right. a guess jeffrey's saying cowbird jasmine said brown-headed cowbird and carrie reba's cowbird yep you're, no, all right. you're all right so there it is the cowbird so they these birds used to follow the cattle um migrations and that's how they um they find their food source all this right. one's a little tougher probably ow this one's a little tougher all right I'm trying to think, what can we say about this guy? And this will be the last one. Um, this was one of my son's favorite birds when he was a kid. Um, and he called, he actually called it Toby. <laughs> so this was a Toby bird for him, which is kind of giving it away a little bit. But I'm trying to think, they, ground birds. Um, it's ground bird. They come in, they, they don't live here year round. They come in, um, Migrate migration. They are also um, an overeater, I think, and they are sexually dimorphic. The females a little um, lighter colored than than the uh, actual adult. Does anybody have a guess? Let's see if anybody anybody can guess this one. All right, we got two guesses from uh, Jeffrey and Janine. Uh, Toby, Eastern Toby. There you go. So that's what this Good one is. Guys. Good job. So now we're actually going to move on to our parrot segment. Okay. And we can finish some of these later. Sure. Because yep. um, we probably have a little more time later. But we're going to start with, um, we have Steven, um, who is our staff member here, and Angie, who is also a staff member. Um, I'll let Steven tell you a little bit about, he also uh, works for Parrot University and helps us with parrots around here. So we're going to get get this switched over. Come here. Oh no, I 
stuff. See, <laughs> I see stuff. Yeah. She's like, oh no, I want to play. Come here. You say hi. I say, ahoy mates, I'm Angie. I'm the CWR Outreach Director. And I'm Stephen. I'm one of the uh, shift leads here. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so Angie, tell us about um, why you're dressed like a pirate and, and what, do you, what, is, what do you do on the weekends? So I coordinate with uh, volunteers and I help get them signed up for orientation and tra uh, scheduling and training. But on the weekends, I like to dress up as a pirate and go to rent fairs. Okay. And um, I'm Steven. Uh, I'm one of the shift leads here. So that, that basically means is that I coordinate the uh, volunteers here when they come in to do shift work. Um, make sure that they know how to provide the animals with clean food and water. Uh, make sure that all the kind of outdoor work, like uh, making sure everybody's got clean food and bedding gets done. And just kind of uh, make myself available to do whatever else needs to be done. So I also get to help assist animals when arriving to the rescue, and I also get to help animals when it's time for them to leave, whether it's through adoptions or releases. Um, so today, uh, I just wanted to thank everybody. Um, last August, we had a horrible house fire, and we lost all three of our birds. And um, because Jennifer set up a GoFundMe account, we were able to rebuild, and we now have five new babies. And this is one of them that came in today. This is uh, Ripley, and Ripley's about 26, 27 years old. She's a blue and gold macaw, and some really good friends of ours. Um, they had rescued her from a really bad situation, and they had her and an umbrella cockatoo in a cage together, and they hung strips of fabric because, you know, it entertained the birds. Why not? It was a great idea. Um, the cockatoo got wrapped up in it and actually hung himself, and Ripley uh, freaked out, plucked out all her feathers because birds grieve just like people do, and they couldn't do anything with her, so they gave her to some really good friends of mine. And after the fire, uh, I went over there, and me and her sort of bonded, and they were uh, able to let us uh, adopt her. So she is one of my many five. I have two Quakers. I love my Quakers. Two Conyers, and of course, Ripple, Ripley here. Say hi. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, uh, as Jennifer said, uh, when I'm not here at the Waterfowl Center, I work at uh, Parrot University, which is a parrot rescue located in Pineville, uh, kind of just past Carolina Place. And I've also got a parrot of my own. His name is Marco, and he's a little eclectus parrot. Uh, if you don't know what an eclectus is, they are just kind of a bright green color with a candy corn colored beak. And fun thing about uh, eclectuses is that they have a tendency to get very hormonal, uh, which basically is a very nice way to say they're prone to sexual frustration. Uh, and that means that it is... It, they bond very, very strongly to people, and it is stressful for them to not be around those people, Marco included. So, it's kind of a mixed blessing for me because it means he's always happy to see me, but it also means that he is very, very unhappy when I go home. Other than that, he's a fairly chill bird. So parrots, I feel, are my spirit animal, and I just love parrots. They bring me so much joy and happiness. Um, they have the greatest personalities, and we're just so thankful to be able to have these babies back into our lives. Yeah. You say hi. You say hi, Ripley. Yeah. Oh, she might be in that. <laughs> yeah, you want that? No. No. <laughs> So tell us something that you would, you would, if I was a new owner and wanted to adopt a parrot, what's something that you would tell me that I probably don't know about parrots? Oh what does it uh, take to keep them as pets? Um, how, how much work are they? Oh yeah, absolutely. So first thing I would say about parrots is that um, their diet is probably not what you would think that they are. Um, a lot of people, and especially at uh, Parrot University, when we get parrots in, uh, they think that because they're birds that they need to be on a seed diet. That's not true. 
Uh, for most parrots, the best diet for them is going to be a mixture of fresh vegetables, fruit, and occasionally nuts and seeds for just a supplement of protein. Now, that's a very uh, labor-intensive diet, of course, so we not all of us have the time to make fresh food for our birds. So, for just that, um, what we recommend that Parrot U is that they be on a pellet diet. So, this is what we give our birds over at Parrot University. Uh, it's called Tops, and it's actually an organic parrot food. Um, it's probably the best out there on the market because it does not use any filler. Um, it's just it's cold compressed. Yeah, cold compressed. It's just basically a mixture of alfalfa, some millet, dandelion leaf, powder, all lots that kind of greens. Thing. Oh yeah, <laughs> lots and lots of greens. Yeah, that's uh, that's the first thing about them. And for most of them, you want them to be about maybe about eighty percent of the pellet diet. Maybe about, and then the rest, just um, any fruits, veggies, or nuts that you want to give them as a supplement. So, I mean, I... so parrots are wonderful pets. For those that don't have any experience or knowledge, I do recommend studying and learning about them before you decide you want to. Um, they haven't been fully domesticated like dogs or cats, and they require a lot of care. They're a very high maintenance pet. Um, they require a minimum of three to five hours, but that's just of interaction. They have a Long lifespans, and some birds can live about 60 years or more uh, with proper care. It seems to me like the larger the bird, the longer they live. Um, so a lot of times these birds will outlive you, your children, and maybe even your grandchildren. Um, so once you bond with your bird, they actually become your best friend for life. They will scream, they will holler, but that's them um, calling out to their flock and wanting to be around you. They just bring me so much love and joy into the world, and we have a few more tips if you're interested in becoming a parent, parent or what we call a parent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, on that subject of them living, you know, long lives, um, you know, what we often hear people ask at Parrot University is that they, they hear that you know parrots will not bond unless they are babies. Um, that is actually not true at all. Um, in fact, because they live such long lives. As long as you are willing to put in the work, the time, and the effort to be with them, to train with them, to give them the love and attention they need, they will absolutely bond with a new person. It's actually not that uncommon for them to you know, bond with several people throughout the course of their lives. And you know, just to kind of tell you guys real quick about you know, the diet again, um, you know, we often do get birds in with Parrot University that have been on bad diets before. And so if you want to switch them on to the pellet diet that we have down there, or if you want to give them more fresh veggies, it's going to be kind of a weaning process. It's going to be, you introduce them very slowly to it with maybe about, maybe about 75% of the old food, mostly their, then 25% of the new food, and then you just kind of work from there very slowly over a period of several weeks, even several months, and then eventually you'll get them on the new diet. What you don't want to you give them though. You shouldn't feed them avocados, onions, mushrooms, chocolate, oranges, spinach greens, as they're toxic and they can kill your bird. Yes. Um, if you are unsure about what to feed your bird, you can always consult your vet. Um, don't feed them peanuts in the shell due to peanut mold, and peanut mold can make your bird very sick or even kill your bird. Yes, and on that subject of food, cooking can even be hazardous to birds. They have very sensitive lungs, so uh, if you have like nonstick uh, cookware around your house, especially Teflon, um, when that cooks, when that heats, that actually releases toxic fumes into the air and it throws the lines in their lungs. Uh, but other things that will kill them are actually, you know, not only the pots and pans, the toaster ovens. Um, you really don't want to be using the, uh, the self-cleaning feature on an oven because that will kill them basically instantly. Um, the only surefire safe cookware that I've ever heard is either stainless steel or ceramic. Um, anything else, you again you would want to discuss with a vet you, you want to make sure they say pto a and ptf pto fe free. free yes i mean that should be on the label of the cookware 
Um, but you know, a lot of companies these days are very kind of aware that people don't like those things. So even though they'll say that there's no hazards on their cookware, um, I wouldn't trust them until you talk with uh, maybe a little bit more of a trusted source, like for example, your vet. <laughs> And remember to clean your stovetops regularly with like soap and water. Um, burnt food can also release chemicals into the air that are toxic and not safe for your bird. Um, I just clean mine with regular soap and water. Yeah. Uh, if you want to uh, mention real quick that what I used for my uh, cage, I'm going to actually, if you wouldn't mind kind of just kind of showing it to the camera real quick, just the label right there. That's what I use to clean my cage at home. That's, uh, that's basically a mild shampoo, and if you just put maybe a couple of teaspoons of that in about maybe about 20 ounces of water, put it in a spray bottle, and you've got a really, what I found a very good, uh, safe and effective, you know, cleaner to be able to use around birds. Would you recommend using that on your cage? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> that's a very good segue for the next subject here, which is cages. Um, cage size is going to be very, very important for whatever kind of parrot you end up with. Um, size does matter, and bigger is usually better. Um, if you can go, go as you possibly can, all the better. Um, it, it doesn't matter. If you've got a little tiny uh, parakeet, or a great big old macaw like Ripley over there, get them as big as you can. Uh, what you have to worry about though is bar size. Um, make sure that you look for something that is small enough that they are not going to be able to get their heads in there, otherwise they're not going to get it out. So cleaning your cage daily and regular maintenance helps when examining their poop. Uh, daily cleaning is simply, you just change out the, the bedding, the paper on the bottom, you can spray it down, wipe down the grates floor, uh, and floors on the bars um, with the bird safe cleaner, like Stephen just showed you. You want to deep clean your cage at least once a month. It helps remove dandruff, old food, anything that's stuck onto the bars. Um, I personally pressure, or pressure wash mine. It's easier for me to drag them out and just take the hose and clean them all down real good. Now, I though, um, I've got my bird in a fairly good size case. Oop, I got the edge tangled up in your chair there. You're Sorry good. That. So, I can't get his cage out to pressure wash very easily. So, what I like to use is this little toy right here. This is actually a portable steam gun that I use on my bird cage. And what I do is that I do first, you know, the usual, spray it down with the cleaner, give it a wiping and all that. And then I fire up this little baby, uh, fill it with water, let the pressure build up, and it will blow off all, anything that I didn't get for the first try. And it will sanitize it very well because it's hot. Now, I will say though, um, if you go, decide to go this out with cage cleaning, you got to be careful because this is very, very hot water under pressure. So, and I actually have had this blow up on me before and it's not fun. Um, I'm okay. I'm okay. No, no just, uh, just my pride hurt that day. But, uh, but yeah, this is just one of the kind of the little options you've got here for keeping your birds' little space all nice and clean for them. So where should they put their cage when they get their bird, Stephen? Okay, so cage positioning, yes, very, also very <laughs> important. You're going to hear us say very important uh, or some variation of that a lot here because it's all important. <laughs> um, but anyway, yes, um, you want their cages to be in a area where they can kind of look around and see the world, but you don't want them to be in a place where they're going to be exposed to any of the usual kitchen hazards that we talked about. So like, for example, you don't want them in the kitchen, but maybe a room off, off to the side of the kitchen is okay. Uh, you don't want them to be in a place where they're going to get direct sunlight because then that's going to make them overheat. It's going to get them too hot. And you want them to be able to be in a place where they can get sleep. Yeah, you don't want them to be like in the center of your house, you know, as it gets dark and, you know, maybe you get, uh, you and your family are still up and about and active, but these guys need eight to ten hours of uninterrupted sleep a night. Otherwise, they're going to be very crabby and 
have some behavioral problems in the future. So you want, so if, if you have a separate room where they can have a little nighttime cage, that would be absolutely the best ideal. Um, if you don't, uh, just make sure that wherever their cage is, is a place where they can get some quiet and some rest for the night. Along with cages, toys. Toys are very important to your bird's health and behavior. Toys provide stimulation, forging opportunities, and they can mimic wild behaviors for the birds, such as preening. Um, you should rot rotate your toys out frequently, examining old toys of potential hazards. Parrots are known to tear them up and break them, so this is a good time to look at those toys individually and replace them if one needed. Um, as I always say, when it out, throw it out. Yep. Um, they can also be great training aids. Um, they can be used to um, entice them with a treat. You can give them puzzles. You can give them ladders. Uh, people have taught their birds how to do things like play basketball. Um, sometimes they've managed to get them to do crazy things like ride little bicycles, though I don't know anybody who's ever, personally, who's ever managed to do that. Um, you want to be able to offer them as much stimulation as you possibly can. And even something as simple as their perches can be important because if you've ever seen an old bird cage, you might see those little dowel, what we call them the dowel perches that are just kind of perfectly circular. Those are not good for their feet. No, you want them to be, have some shape to them. You want them to um, have some texture to them so that their feet can be wear down and their nails can be wear down worn down sorry um but yeah you don't want them to be sitting on those little round uh dowel perches because it actually creates pressure points on their feet a bit like if you or i were to wear really bad shoes your early checkups are another awesome way to keep track of your parrot's health uh, it's important to have a good relationship with your avian vet um the vet is the best resource for your parrot care and health your vet can also uh, give vaccines. They do with a uh, yearly checkup. They can also microchip. I think uh, Dr. Powers up in Huntersville, she is very good at microchipping birds. Mm -hmm. um, that's also your best defense and protection for if an accidental uh, takeoff and um, they escape out of the house, it's easier to prove that that bird is yours when you microchip a dog or a cat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now. And one of the best ways, of course, to prevent an accidental, you know, escape is not to let birds free fly. I mean, I've talked to people who, you know, they don't like the idea of keeping their birds in cages all day, and that's fine. Um, but you don't want them to be free roaming outside. Um, these birds are not native to our area. They can't defend themselves against the predators that we have here. They can't survive against the, the environment or the elements that we have out here. So... You really don't want a bird, your parrot, to be out and about. So, the you know the best thing you can do to give them as much space as possible is either you know you can devote an area of your house to your bird, or you can do what Miss Andy's going to do and actually build yourself a place for your parrot to go. Yes, we're planning on building an uh, enclosed-in aviary right off the house. So in the summertime, it'll have a a roof and it'll have mesh all the way around. It'll have hardware wire underneath the woods to prevent anything from getting into it. So these birds will be able to come outside and of course they will be supervised outside. I don't, I don't let my birds out unless they are supervised. Yeah, And of course um, if you do have an outside aviary for them you want them to be in their carriers when Absolutely. you're transferring them. Unless of course you can connect it direct to your house. Uh, you do not ever want, you know, your parrots to be free. I know that seems like a very harsh thing to say, even if for, for a very short distance, but no, you want them to either be in a carrier. If you can harness train them, you absolutely can, but you want to avoid that possibility as much as possible. And of course, another good reason to take your bird to regular checkups is because parrots are very good at hiding sickness. Um, checking their poop is your first defense against the sickness. Um, it alerts you to different changes, if they're eating, if they're hydrated, if they're dehydrated. Um, and if you notice, contact your vet as soon as possible. 
Yes, I mean, it seems like a, it seems odd that we should be talking about poop, um, and yeah. <laughs> speaking as bird owners, we have both looked at and even handled our bird's poop. Many um, times. Washing our hands <laughs> afterwards, of course, but a good poop um, is one that is reasonably solid. Um, it's got kind of a dull green color to it, very little bit of white to it, and it should be sort of moist to the touch, but not very wet. A bad poop, though, is one that has lots of liquid to it. Um, it's very odd colors. If it's bright green, that can be a sign of you know liver damage. If it's maybe something yellow, that can be kidneys. And if you notice that it is maybe really, really dark colored and has a very sticky or tarry texture, that can actually be a sign of internal bleeding. And that's basically a worst case kind of scenario. Um, though, we should say this with a bit of a caveat though, diet can affect what your bird's poop looks like as well. So like for example, if you give your bird blueberries or red pepper, that will change the color of their poop quite significantly. And because these are both very high moisture foods, it can make them a little bit wet as well. So also if you are just out and about and you're taking your bird, say to the vet and you notice, you know, it's a little bit runnier than normal, that's okay because sometimes their nerves can play a little effect yeah. with that. But so, you just want to check it daily just to make sure. Yes. I mean, it's just, like we said, it's a, it's, it sounds like a strange thing. <laughs> it's a very strange habit. But, but let's be honest, we're, we're all bird people here. We're all a little bit strange. <laughs> <laughs> now, I often get asked, especially when doing the wren fairs, if it's okay to pet my parrot. Now, a lot of parrots don't like to be pet. Um, it's kind of weird. It's like if you were to go to the store and some stranger starts rubbing up all over you. I personally am grabbing my pepper spray. <laughs> Birds don't have that option. They have usually two responses. They're either going to fly away or they're going to bite you. Um, so just remember, if a bird does let you pet, you should always give head scratches and never down the back. When you rub down the back, it signifies that you are wanting to be uh, more than friends. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, this is a conversation that we have sometimes have some difficulty having with people who want to adopt from us at Parrot University. Um, is the, any contact that is not on top of the head, maybe the back of the neck, is basically a simulation of mating behavior. And this can lead to very mixed signals for them. It makes them think that you want to mate, but then you don't mate, and then it leads to some frustration. So you want to make sure that you are handling your bird right when you do it. And the other thing about handling birds is that um, you don't want to you don't want them to be confined as you hold them. So like if you see the, you know, like the YouTube videos and all that, where you've got, you see people, you know, holding their bird in their hand or keeping them close. Um, like I'm sure you do this, but your, uh, your birds love you. They know you. And, that, and that's, that's the thing. Uh, if you see something like that on, on the internet, it's either because that bird knows, loves, and trusts that person very, very much, or that bird's actually not happy at all. Um, they need to know that they have an out whenever you handle them. Mm -hmm. So make sure you always give them some, somewhere else to go if they decide, okay, I've had enough, I need to go away now. And you should never just walk up to somebody's, somebody's cage and stick your finger in there. That's a good way to get hurt real quick. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, I think that's about all we have for our parrots. If there anybody any, has questions? Any, any questions, comments, concerns, or... Yeah. Huh? Really want to say hi to everybody really? again? Really? You want to come here? Ah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was You've been such that. a good girl. <laughs> yeah. Say hi. No, we're not going on my shoulder. Yes. No, we're trying to break that. <laughs> say hi. Can you do big wings? Can you put them up. Put them up. Yeah. Oh. Put them up. <laughs> Yay, Ripley! Put them up. Yay. She is an attention hog. She loves attention. Oh, yay, Ripley! Woo! Yay! What a pretty bird. Such a pretty bird. I love you. Kisses. 
Oh, now out of my shoulder. <laughs> yes, what a good girl. Yes, you can kind of see that, you know, we don't want them on our shoulders partially because, you know, they we have to be able to see what they're doing. And especially for big birds like her. That's a good way to miss an eye. <laughs> yes. And it's not even like they would deliberately are trying to hurt you or anything when they do it. I mean. Well, birds get scared mm -hmm. and they lose their balance. And, of course, your face is the first thing that they're going to grab a hold to. Yes. And if they see something that is frightening to them and they want to warn you, what's the quickest way to warn you? Mm -hmm. Give you a good old bite. <laughs> And yes, birds do bite. It's yes. not a matter of when, because you will get bit if you own a parrot. Yes. So it's just a matter of knowing why they are biting, what they're reacting to, so you can fix it. A lot of times, something you're doing, oh. something outside that's going on, yes. and it's a good thing just to know your bird. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know that uh, when I'm at home with my bird, he's, he's a little alarm system. He goes <laughs> crazy if there is just somebody who passes by the window and if something like that happens I don't tend to handle him so <laughs> he needs to be calm when I let him out of his cage. Uh -huh. Any questions? Stephanie said y'all are amazing. Oh, oh thank you Stephanie. Well do we have any parrot questions or anybody that wants to ask a question about parrot behavior or? Uh, I, I will say that if we don't have any you know on the uh on the chats or anything um you know this is a perfect opportunity for us to plug you know parrot university oh absolutely yeah they're uh now, parrot they're, you, their yeah, classes yeah abs oh absolutely oh yes. they have some amazing parrot classes yes. even if you don't adopt from them i do recommend taking the classes they have a lot of valuable information oh yeah absolutely and of course you know they're they're also what I would say one-stop shop for all things parrots. I oh, mean, absolutely. We've got the toys, we've got the food. Cages. I mean, cages, absolutely. Anything you could possibly need or want yes. for carrot. <laughs> you can't see her, but I don't she's think dancing. Can see her, but yeah. she's dancing. She's singing the praises, too. I've <laughs> yes. actually been working with Parrot University, I don't know, probably as long as you have. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> we, we, we do accept some parrots here, but they get sent there. Yes. Um, and the reason that we do that is I feel like any time someone can do a better job than we can, that's what we need to do. So we like having the cool parrot here too, but if somebody does a better job, uh, then that is where the animal should always go, where it will be um, cared for the best. And, um, you know, these parrots require so much care. Mm -hmm. And I, I strongly, strongly believe in their model that you take the classes before you adopt the birds and they have a, a much more extensive uh, adoption program that I feel like is better suited for these mm -hmm. animals. Uh, so we've always recommended them. We always work with them on all of our parrots and, um, you know, can't say enough good things about them as far as... Um, the experience we have working with them for for years and years now. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know how long it's been. I actually met with the original founders of the Parrot University before they opened the store and helped them with setting up their nonprofit. So, they, um, you know, helped a lot of people get their rescues up and started. And that was one of them that I did help. And it's changed hands since then, but. Um, I, I actually, um, you know, uh, Amber, who owns the store now and is a friend of ours, and um, we love her a lot. She does a great job. I'll have to tell her you said so. Yeah, <laughs> I do. Mariah. So, Mariah's there, too. She oh, yeah. yeah. She's, she's, at the, uh, she's at the storefront most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> so we should have. Sue Gilder on Facebook also said uh, to add with the Teflon related fume danger the cooking bags, like the ones they sell for oh, yeah. and oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Those yeah. are very bad. Those uh, have metallic um, in them and um, they're very toxic for parents. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Just I, to throw that out there. Oh, I, no, I had um, doves. I had pet doves at my house. Um, they were just the little like Inca doves mm -hmm. and my son uh, was probably eight and um, he, we were we were making some macaroni and cheese or something and the spatula fell out of the uh, pan onto the burner and it's the not the uh, gas electric burner 
As soon as it hit there, um, it started to melt. And of course I knew immediately, as soon as I smelled something, I was like, I gotta get my from um, this side of the room to the other, my birds were dead. Mm -hmm. um, because that plastic had fallen and burned and it took just a second for them to die. Um, I, I seen them dying. I'm running towards them. I'm pushing I'm, I'm just going to push the whole cage out the back door because you can't really air it out fast enough. You know, yeah. um, people don't understand how bird rep respiratory system works where we inhale and exhale the same breath, but they have this very unique respiratory system that maximizes oxygen. And so when they inhale, um, that breath goes around their different um, air sacs and, and lungs and so they can pull all the oxygen out of that breath and then they breathe it back out so it, what we would get one breath in and out is like four or five breaths for them of the same yeah, uh, the same toxin so that's why they're so susceptible to the fumes and it just happens really really quickly you just have to be super careful and that was just an accident um, and honestly, I just didn't keep birds at my house really after that. I was very traumatized mm -hmm. uh, by the whole incident. So, um, you know, I, I just, even, even when you're super careful, you can oh, still yeah. have stuff happen. That's how yeah, sensitive absolutely. they are. That's like us with the house fire. We yeah. were super careful not to have any of that stuff in there. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't always work the way you, the way you want, but yeah. we do our best. Yeah. So I think we're ready for... Um, our next uh, speaker, which is Anantika, and um, uh, what I will say about her is if you see all the social media posts and all the wonderful stuff she writes on our page, this, this is the, uh, the person behind that magic. And I think I'm going to embarrass her a little bit. <laughs> she does an awesome job. Oh, she yeah. does an awesome job for us, um, and she's going to come on and... Uh, a little bit about turtles and some of the um, turtles that we have here for adoption. So just give us a minute to swap out. Thanks for coming, Riley. Ripley. Sorry. <laughs> Now, I gotta follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> no costumes, it's a fact. You want me to do that up here? Um, I'm okay. So, um, I'm Manantika and I'm the marketing director at TWR. Um, I don't do what I do alone, and I have a really big team who supports me. Um, I've, I joined just under seven months ago, and my background education was in graphic design. So what I really enjoy is being able to um, do educational graphics for our social media, our local presentations, <laughs> or our community events. And I got the opportunity to design our um, 2023 animal photo calendar last year, which I really enjoyed and I've learned how to improve on it for this year. So um, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm in charge of doing the social media. If you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, TikTok, or YouTube, you've seen some of my work. Our awesome animal photos and videos are taken by a lot of the staff and volunteers who CWR wouldn't exist without. 
Um, and if you ask a question under a post, chances are that you're interacting with another CWR social media volunteer and they're awesome and they're always happy to answer questions and engage with the public. Um, I've been able to strengthen my video editing, editing skills while I've been here and continue to learn new things. I started creating monthly newsletters for CWR and now I work on organizing our, our or helping to organize our fundraising campaigns. Um, and if you've come into the facility, you might have seen me sitting behind Angie. My face is usually behind my laptop. Angie's our outreach director. You just saw her if you were watching. I've loved getting to learn about the volunteers because they're so passionate about what they do and they show up every day, rain or shine. Um, there's no way we'd be able to do what we do without them. Our staff is really dedicated, but in order to medically treat every animal here, you know, we, we need somebody who's doing the laundry and the produce prep and the cleaning and feeding the animals and fixing wonky wood boards or <laughs> changing out fresh towels in our hospital. And that's all done mostly by our volunteers. And those are just the on-site ones. Our off-site ones run our injured animal hotline. They represent us at events and they catch and transport so many animals in need to us from all over the Carolinas. And I've heard of volunteers going into sewers just to save an animal. <laughs> they'll go at any time of day and drive any distance. So there's no limit to what they'll do. A lot of my coworkers are bird or reptile owners, but I am neither. I just knew I wanted to work at an ASU because I wanted to use my abilities after college for animal welfare, and then I learned about CWR. I knew next to nothing about waterfowl and landfowl, not to mention the farm animals and exotic reptiles that we care for. And the most perspective changing thing I learned while I've been here is how emotionally complex geese and chickens and ducks are. They form really deep emotional attachments with their families. And you can tell when they've been traumatized or when they have deep love for someone. And now I've seen it with my own two eyes, just how complex they feel their emotions and how heavily they really do experience the same human emotions that we feel. But enough about them. Today I'm going to talk about turtles. So with me today I have one of our red ear slider turtles who um, is available for adoption. With I think we have four other turtles currently. And these are cat... This is a captive bred turtle who um, can also be found in the wild, but because of the pet trade, they are one of the most common pet turtles as well. We take in a lot of surrendered red-eared sliders um, and other turtle varieties like yellow-bellied sliders as well and box turtles. They usually come to us when a person is no longer able to care for them or as an alternative to rehoming them or releasing them in the wild, which I'll talk more about later because you should never do that or if somebody has kidnapped them from the wild and then decides they don't want to take care of them. And then usually the last and saddest reason is when health issues persist for too long and their turtle is too sick and they don't know where else to turn. The sliders are semi-aquatic turtles that each have their own personalities. They can be pretty outgoing and playful. You can see this guy has his head poked out um, because he's gotten a little bit used to being here right now, but usually he's kept in water um, with a basking area. Some fast facts about sliders is that as their name indicates, well, red-eared sliders, that you can't see him, but he'll have a red marking just behind his eye, which is not actually his ear though, even though it appears to be in the same place. Um, at full size, they can grow to about the size of a dinner plate or about 12 inches long. The females will be a little bit larger than the males. And uh, something helpful to be able to tell females from males apart is that the females will have shorter claws and longer claws on males allow them to mount to the females and they'll also have concave um, bottom shells which helps with the same process. They'll also have longer tails, the males will. And in the wild, their mating season lasts from March to July. The mating takes place underwater. Females will nest on soft sandy soil where lots of sunlight hits to keep their eggs warm and they generally reach sexual maturity at about five to six years of age. It can take both males and females about eight years to reach their full length. <laughs> and um, they are, yeah, as I mentioned before, they're pretty common in the pet trade, but in captivity, they can live for about uh, anywhere from 20 to 40 years, depending on how well they're cared for. And then the last like quick fact is that they are listed as one of the top 100 most invasive species in the world, which I'll also explain a little bit later. So I think pet stores and breeders can give up the impression that pet turtles are low maintenance and low responsibility animals that don't require diligent long-term work, but that's false. Properly cared for um, in a home, as I mentioned, they can live for decades. 
and you need to consider things like a nutritious diet, proper reptile lighting, and an appropriate tank size and setup. Our primary recommendation for tank size is 10 gallons per inch of shell. So red-eared slider, sliders will grow to about a foot. As I mentioned, he's not full grown. Um, so 10 uh, gallons per 10 inches would be about 100 to 125 gallons for a full grown red-eared slider. And you should fill your tank up to almost um, the top, but leave room at the top for a floating basking station where they have enough room to get out of the water. The water quality needs to be maintained no matter what. So in your tank, you need a really good filter that has the capacity to filter through not just your tank size, but ideally something rated for two times your tank size. So for example, like a Cascade or Fugal brim filter with a range that includes 200 gallons or a red-eared slider. You'd have to look up for um, if you have a different variety of pet turtle and see what their full grown weight, uh, sizes turn out to be. You should lay gravel at the bottom of the tank because gravel can house helpful bacteria, which just helps regulate the water chemistry in the tank. And you should also put in logs and um, plants because that will just help your th turtle thrive. Nobody wants to stay in a completely empty room. And um, if there's logs and artificial plants in there, then it gives them a lot of opportunity to explore and stay stimulated and enriched with their environment. And it's really good for their emotional well-being, not just their physical well-being. Uh, earlier I mentioned a, a dry basking area and you should make sure that this basking area is 100% dry because they need somewhere where they can dry off completely. It shouldn't be like partially submerged in the, in the water or get splashed on because if they're not um, able to dry up 100%, then algae and fungus can start growing on their shell. Um, and then another thing is even with the water filter, you should do tank partial water changes. Um, every week, I'd say maybe 20 to 30% of the water can be removed and replenished. Again, this just helps to maintain the ecosystem that you've worked so hard to create, and it'll help with the water chemistry. Something really important is UVB lighting and heat. These are essential. You should not underestimate the need for both UVB and heat. Don't just give them heat because you're keeping them inside, so they need um, the right kind of replacement for the sun. Uh, it should be the UVB bulb and heat bulb should the dry basking area. You should put a thermometer in that area once your bulbs are set up so you can ensure that the basking area is at 80 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, anywhere in that range. And then the water that they um, swim in should be between 73 to 78 degrees, uh, which can be achieved with a water heater if the water isn't doesn't naturally stay at that temperature in your home, depending on the temperature you keep your home at. You should raise and lower the height of the heat lamps um, if the temperature doesn't fall in that range that it should above the basking station, which again is 88 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So UVB is so essential because UVB rays absorb through their skin, create vitamin D, which is how they process and utilize calcium for their diets. Calcium is an essential mineral for turtles as it helps them to maintain strong bones, keep their shells strong and healthy, and to carry out many important bodily functions. And heat, of course, is required since turtles are reptiles and ectothermic. And as I mentioned, the point of heat and UVB both is to mimic sunlight. So you don't need to have those lamps on at nighttime because you're just following the natural rhythm of the day. Another super important part of turtle care is their diet. Um, a lot of care should be taken to feed your turtle a well-balanced diet. Don't overfeed your turtle. Don't dump in a bunch of pellets. Commercial turtle pellets like um, Missouri brand can make up a 25% base of their diet, but providing them with a variety of animal matter and vegetable matter is not only healthy, but another source of enrichment and stimulation. Animal matter should make up another 25% of their um, diet and then vegetables should account for 50% when they're adults. They shouldn't be allowed to gorge themselves on protein. I know we received um, a turtle maybe last year who had only been fed worms and it really impacted him, like his health adversely because they will fill up on protein and that can cause liver or kidney issues and also call, cause pyramiding in their shell. The scoots will start growing upward. And I'll we see surrendered turtles, turtles come in from come in with are from poor diets. 
So what is the right kind of animal matter? Dried mealworms, crickets, and snails are healthy. And you, should, you can feed it to them in moderation, as I said, because they're high in protein. Good vegetables to feed a red-eared slider like him are leafy greens like dandelions, mustard greens, the tops of carrots. I have some carrots here for him, but he just wants to <laughs> run away. <laughs> and then uh, bell pepper is also safe for them, along with squash and romaine lettuce. However, you should never ever feed your pet turtle just iceberg or romaine lettuce. Same goes for tortoises. You may have recently read about a case that we got last summer before I started here of a tortoise named Tommy and he he was in really bad condition he had developed gout and he went into renal failure while he was here because of years of a lettuce only based diet and his owners they really loved him but they just didn't have the they didn't have the education to know that feeding him only lettuce wasn't filling him up or giving him any nutrition at all uh, when you're feeding your turtle vegetables check beforehand that there are no pesticides on the vegetables I know one and <laughs> Some, you can also feed them water plants, like water lettuce, water hyacinth, or duckweed. And then fruit should be used really, really sparingly because it's really high in sugar and they don't find that in their natural habitat. So we, if you're keeping a turtle as a pet, you do want to give them the opportunity to live a life as similar to one they would live in the wild. Maybe you can give them the occasional banana. But um, another thing is we don't really recommend giving them feeder guppies or goldfish. Some people, like pet stores will sell those kinds of small fish to give your pet turtle. But um, in research I found, it's been shown to block their vitamin production. And a lot of their health concerns are caused from vitamin deficiency. So it's just one way to be preventative. Um, ways to look out for if your turtle is feeling sick, like visible signs would be stuck sheds, uh, stunted growth, swollen eyes, loss of appetite and mobility. If, they, if you see abscesses that can form behind their eyes on either side of their head, or brittle or upturned shells, um, those are all warning signs to look out for. These are just the symptoms though, not the problems. So please don't wait. You should take your pet turtle to the nearest reptile vet. Um, prevention is the best medicine, but quick oh, remediation left. is 10 times better than letting your turtle suffer. Our yellow belly slider turtle grandma, who you may have seen on our social media, she was a yellow belly, not a red eared, but she was my favorite turtle that we had here. But good news is that she just recently got adopted and she's been renamed Maud. <laughs> we found her in a dump well we didn't find her but dumpster divers found her in a dumpster one night in december and she had fishing line wrapped around her neck and she was missing t her two limbs on her right side and she was super sweet and um would love to take produce from you and so she's in a really good home now and we're really happy and this guy and our other turtles like him are available for adoption through www.cwrescue.org slash adoption dash application. And then um, you can email Naomi, our adoption coordinator at adopt.cwrescue.org if you have questions about our process. The last thing I wanna talk about is just two quick things. Releasing a turtle into the wild and seeing a turtle on the road. Please never release a pet turtle in the wild because the turtle will either die or cause damage to the ecosystem if it survives after being dumped. If that doesn't stop you, it's illegal as well. So captive raised turtles being dumped into ponds and such when people give up on them is the reason it's some, in some areas they're not even allowed to be kept as pets. Any animal that has been raised in captivity has a slim chance of survival if thrown into the wild, even if it's considered a wild animal. And some people do take um, red-eared spiders out of wild, which also is illegal. And if they do happen to survive, if a captive raised turtle happens to survive in the wild, then they're doing lots of damage to the ecosystem that they're introduced to because they begin competing for food and they can also spread diseases to the native animals there that haven't built up immunity. So just please don't release a turtle into the wild that you've raised. Bring it to us and we can help you with rehoming the turtle. And then turtles crossing roads. If you can help them across in the direction they're going then you can go for it but don't turn them around in the opposite direction because they have a pretty strong internal navigation system and so if you move them back they're just gonna try to cross again 
And if you see a turtle that has been run over on the road, um, you might think that the turtle has already passed away and you might just drive by. But we really, really ask that you stop and pick up the turtle and bring it to us. Because even though these turtles are gravely injured, they don't die quickly. Even with their shells crushed, they can feel pain for days or even weeks. And if you bring it to us instead, we can humanely euthanize the turtle at no cost to you and offer them a peaceful passing. Thank you to everyone who has brought us vehicle injured turtles in the past. We just received a snapping turtle last week and it was really sad to see him in pain, but at least we were able to help him find some relief. So again, yeah, if you see turtles hit in the road, we actually bring them to us and we can help. And that's all for me, rather than taking questions because I've talked a lot. I wanted to direct <laughs> you to some resources that have helped me learn more about the proper care required for pet turtles. The first resource being Jennifer Gordon. <laughs> the second resource being our injured animal hotline, which is 704-286-6330. The third resource is a website called the Spruce Pets, and they have a lot of comprehensive guides for lots of different animals, not just turtles. And then the last resource, if you find instructional videos more helpful, there's a girl called The Turtle Girl on YouTube, and she provides accurate information as well. So he didn't eat any of his carrots, but <laughs> they were here for him. So thank, thank you, you for listening to Yay. my talk. Yay. All right, so up next, we have Logan. Um, Logan's our staff member. He works in the rehabilitation department. He's mentoring under um, me for him license and his favorite animal is opossums a, a even though we don't really take possums um logan's going to talk to you a little bit about possums and uh you're good right there and so i'll let uh logan go ahead and start with his possum information hey all my name is logan sarvey and i'm an assistant rehabber here at cwr <laughs> Um, I'm sure you couldn't tell by just looking at me, but I love opossums. They're my favorite <laughs> animal of all time. <laughs> so I'm also very bad with presentations, so please bear with me. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a general overview of opossums, what they look like, what diet they have, um, then some quick possum facts for you. <laughs> so as an over overview, uh, opossums have existed for around two to five million years. Uh, they are marsupials, which are mammals that undergo the early part of their development in their mother's womb and the rest in her pouch are, um, yep. <laughs> They're the only marsupial native to the United States. Um, other examples uh, would be kangaroos, koalas, wombats, wallabies, Tasmanian devils, and also possums. And no, I didn't just repeat. Uh, opossum and possum are two different animals. Opossums, again, are native here, and possums are native to Australia, and they look more like sugar gliders. They're really small. Um, there are 60 opossum species in the world many of which inhabit Mexico, Central America, um, to the U.S. for the third time now. <laughs> the entirety of the country, but are mostly associated with the East Coast uh, as European colonists that first discovered them, uh, discovered them in Virginia. Uh, even the scientific name of the, Virgin of the Virginia opossum, um, Didelphus virginiana, is interesting. Uh, Didelphus, it comes from the ancient Greek word, word for double womb. The word opossum actually comes from apassum, which is an Algonquin Indian word for white animal. I guess I'll just move on to what they look like. I'm sure everybody who is watching has seen an opossum. Um, the, they typically are between two to three feet in length, um, and then they have a tail that can also between, be between eight and 13 inches. Um, they can weigh a range of 4.2 to 6.2 pounds and as high as 8.8 .8 to 13.2 pounds, which is huge. Uh, male opossums generally weigh more and are larger than female opossums. Uh, they have long pointed faces with black eyes and long whiskers and a pink nose, and they have hairless ears and, that are black tipped or edged in white. Excuse me. Their thin hair makes them really susceptible to frostbite, unfortunately, so they usually won't inhabit regions that are prone to frost or extreme colds. Um, they have the most teeth, this is an interesting fact, the most teeth of any land mammal in the United States, and it's 50. Uh, but they seldom use them unless you deliberately provoke them. Um, even then, they may not bite. I've seen instances where they, you know, they bear and hiss and act like they're going to be all tough, and then, you know, they get picked up and nothing. <laughs> um, they have what's called a prehensile tail, um, and that just means it's hairy, hairless, uh, scaly, and long. And they can grasp things like an extra hand would. 
Um, and a lot of people associate opossums with being able to hang from tree limbs by their tail. Um, that's kind of true. It's not true for adults as they're too heavy and it would hurt them. But for babies, there's pictures and, and videos of babies doing that. Um, their feet are bare and they have fingers, which are te technically called dexterous toes. Each of the uh, hind feet has a hallux, which is a thumb, um, and all the digits are clawed except for the hallux, and it is used for climbing. And they're really good climbers. Um, some interesting facts here. Naturally, they are very high, uh, have a very high immunity, um, particularly towards snake venom, um, and they're actually immune to snakes in their native region, uh, with the ex uh, exception of the coral snake. Um, Researchers uh, at San Jose State University have found and recreated a peptide uh, found in opossums, and they took that peptide after recreating it and put it in mice and found that that peptide, which is immune to certain snake venoms, they, they put it with the, they gave it to the mouse with uh, rattlesnake venom, and the mouse was actually immune to that rattlesnake venom. So there's a lot of things that can be done medically with opossums um, and research into the animal that um, could benefit humans down the road. Um, I have a patient here on opossum rehab. Um, opossums are not completely blind. Um, they can generally see a few feet in front of them, which is unfortunately why you often see them hit by cars. Um, their vision gets better at night, but during the day, it's about a two to three foot span of space they can see. Um, and they're not very fast. I'm sure you all, when driving, have seen them trying to run across the road and they look all derpy and waddle around. <laughs> Um, so what, what could you do if you do find a possum that has been hit by a car? Um, if you do, um, and you're comfortable doing so, please safely remove the animal from the road and, and to the side of the road. Um, they can generally have up to 13 infants or joeys carried in uh, the mother's pouch for the first two to three weeks um, while they're still being fed by the mother, and then on, uh, the mother will carry the young on the back for another um, one to two months. So um, I would recommend checking the pouch and surrounding area um, for baby opossums if you do find a possum that was hit by a car. Um, place the injured opossum in a box with a soft cloth in a warm location. If the young have exited the pouch, wrap them up in a cloth and place them in a box with the mother. And then um, always contact a licensed re rehabber or a veterinarian for um, if you can drop them off for rehabilitation services or for any other information you may need. If you're not comfortable with moving the opossum, um, again, contact a licensed rehabber or someone who is willing to move the animal um, and then stay with the animal so it's easy for that person to locate them. Um, a, another good section would be when, when, when do you think a possum really is an orphan? Um, because uh, So there's a lot of opossums that become orphan after the mother is unfortunately killed or when they fall from the, her back because it's like a little school bus and they're on the back and they sometimes get jostled off and then they don't move very fast. Um, and they become separated. Um, some juveniles are out on their own the first time and are often brought to within seven inches from the nose to the rump, not the tail, <laughs> um, should be uh, considered um, needing immediate assistance. If you find a young opossum, check the surrounding area as there could be more. Um, listen for a sneezing type of sound, which is what they'll make when they are separated from their mother. Um, I would demonstrate, but I'm not too familiar with how that <laughs> sounds, honestly. Um, they also could make a hissing noise when approached uh, and are scared. Um, I'm sure you've seen that if you've ever interacted with an opossum. It is illegal in North Carolina to keep a native mammal in captivity without a license. However, you can provide them temporary assistance until the animal is with a veterinarian or licensed rehabber or a zoo. Again, when in doubt, please try to contact a licensed rehabber or veterinarian. Um, is the possum really dead? I'm sure you've heard of playing possum. Um, they're, if they're not severely injured uh, or in the road, uh, they could be playing possum, which is an involuntary response to danger. Um, other uh, animals that do that are, are deer who will involuntary, baby deer will um, um, unintentionally drop to the ground and um, stop moving because predators will uh, try to follow movement. And so that's, the, that's a way that they can get out of that kind of situation. Um, so they may appear dead and be unconscious and stiff, and you may notice a green or clear body fluid and a very bad smell. All of that is part of the playing dead. Um, they'll get stiff, not move, and smell really bad. Um, so first thing you can do until help is found is uh, get the possum warm. Uh, injured opossums and babies that are less than seven inches from the head to the rump are uh, in need of immediate assistance. The worst dangers to the orphans are uh, chilling and dehydration. You can provide temporary care until help arrives by placing the infants in a box uh, or a plastic container lined with some kind of material such as a t-shirt or a sweatshirt or blankets. 
Uh, cover them with the same material and provide a heat source, such as a heating pad set on a low heat underneath one half of the box container. Alternative heat sources are hot water bowls, plastic bottles filled with warm water, heated bean bags, and things along that nature. Um, and then cover the heat source and place the infants near but not in direct contact with it. The temperature should be warm and not crazy hot. Um, and yeah, and please use caution. Um, their proper diet and, and hydration and care are, are necessary to keep the animal alive. So again, please don't try to feed or, or give anything to. Um, you can leave water out, but, um, um, and especially never try to give baby opossums cow's milk. Um, if they get older, um, they could have some metabolic issues um, associated with bad diet and they would never be able to be released back into the wild again. Um, and I'm going to skip this because this one is redundant. Um, and then I guess I'll just do some quick facts. Um, I know those are, those are the longer facts, these are now the quick facts. Um, <laughs> so they are a great pest control and they will eat snails, slugs, roaches, and beetles. They have the opposable thumbs that I mentioned earlier. They have uh, prehensile tails, also mentioned earlier. Um, we went over playing dead. They have over four dozen teeth. Opossums and possum, again, are two different animals, so we'll call this a review as well, because I didn't realize I wrote the same exact thing down for these. <laughs> <laughs> they eat 90% um, of ticks attached to them, which is approximately 5,000 per tick season. Um, and this actively reduces the spread of Lyme disease, which go them, Lyme disease is terrible. Um, they have very good memories, at least pertaining to food, um, so we're similar in that uh, aspect. Um, in lab settings, they're able to remember routes to food better than rats, cats, dogs, and pigs. And they can also remember the smell of toxic substances up to a year after ingesting it. And it's extremely unlikely for opossums to get rabies. This was always a cool fact for me. This is probably the first opossum fact I ever learned. Um, um, their, their body temperature is actually too low to harbor rabies for the most part. There are rare instances where it can happen and has been recorded, but it's such a small percentage. Um, we generally consider them to just be immune. Um, and then while they're considered dirty, um, they're actually extremely clean and tidy animals. Um, they use their tongue and paws uh, to groom like a house cat would. Um, and this is partially due to the fact that they don't really have sweat glands, so they'll cool themselves down with their own saliva. But it actually makes them completely odorless, which I did not know until looking at more opossum facts, so I'm adding this to my repertoire. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is generally my entire presentation here. Um, uh, I don't think we're taking questions, so. Well, if they we have can. questions, we will. Why don't you talk a little bit about what you do here? Um, so I assist um, with other assistant rehabbers to um, take in uh, orphan, injured, and sick waterfowl and um, work with Jennifer over here um, to ensure they get the, the best care and set up in order to um, get them back to a proper health and then eventually, hopefully, the goal is always to release them back into the wild. Um, we take, um, well again, mainly waterfowl, but you know, baby birds with Laurel's program. Um, we occasionally will get mammals in as well. Um, and then uh, owner surrenders will make sure they're all good and set to go for another um, home. Um, and then we also will, will take reptiles as was discussed earlier in amphibians. So what are some of the um, things you, you, you're treating right now as far as wounds or like conditions? What, what's the most common thing you think you you see in rehab? Most common thing that comes in, I would probably say, um, would be certain types of collisions with songbirds. We get a lot of those, so um, usually running into house windows or maybe hit by a car. Um, that, and then I guess second comment would probably be predator attacks, mainly cats and dogs. So those of you with house cats, um, please keep your cats inside. I have two cats, one named Possum and the other one named Goose <laughs> uh, for uh, obvious reasons. But um, uh, cats have a lot of bacteria in their saliva and it can make it really difficult to rehabilitate some of these songbirds as they come in. Um, they, they, you know, they get shocked with a lot of antibiotics in order to make sure they're going to be okay as soon as they get in. Um, but um, generally, yeah, I would say collisions, predator attack, hit by cars, another one. Um, a lot of uh, uh, geese come in hit by car, which is really unfortunate. So anytime you see any Canada geese crossing the road, please make sure to stop and put your hazards on. Make sure nobody's trying to go around and maybe they won't see the geese crossing and accidentally hit them. But, um, you know, as you would do, I would say uh, treat the geese as you would kids crossing the road, honestly. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So Anantika was telling us how um, she changed her perceptions of 
uh, animals when she realized how strong their bonds are and how emotional they are. Is there an animal that you've gotten to know better since you've been here that you've learned about um, that surprised you or was not what you thought? Yeah, I would say when we had the um, avian influenza and we were all doing the satellite program bringing those birds home, mm -hmm. um, having George and Nancy, who were the two Emden geese that came and I kept in my house and I had a lot of time to spend with George trying to get him back up and going. And um, that was probably one of the closest connections to an animal I've had. And unfortunately, he didn't make it because his winds were too severe. And um, so I have a little, my sister is a really good artist, and she actually drew a little picture of him. So I have a little memorial in my house for him. But, uh, um, he, was, he was a really great goose. And because um, you can really see, like, when you start working with them, they have a lot of personality. You usually don't think so with, with geese, especially because they're all like, yeah, they're gonna hiss at you, I'm gonna bite you. And it's the same with the opossums too. Opossums um, they'll hiss and, and snarl and stuff, but they're really sweet creatures. All these animals are really sweet and they get a bad rap. People think these are nu nuisances, mm -hmm. but no, they're not. They're, they're, they're really great, have great personality. And um, um, they uh, mate for life is another thing too. Um, so they really care for their mates. So anytime that we get a goose in and they left their mate up and say, Raleigh or Wilmington or whatever, we make an effort to go and bring them back to um, their mate. And you can see in some of the release videos how happy they are to see their mate. So you know there's that emotional connection even they have within their own communities, which is really interesting to see. Well, thank you, Logan. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate you coming in. Uh, who do we have next? Thank you, Emerson. Thank you. Sonia. Sonia. Okay. If we didn't have a lot of questions, who doesn't want to see some duckies swim? Yeah. <laughs> All right. We gotta so, get that. So why we have up next? We have our um, staff veterinarian, Dr. Burrell, is here, and um, we're gonna do a Q and A. And so if you have any questions for her, you can put them in the chat. And um, are you following on the chat? Yeah. Uh, we'll pull out any questions you have for the veterinarian. If not, I have some questions for her. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but we're gonna um, also uh, we have some baby ducks that we're gonna let you guys watch while we um, while we talk. Cable's gonna be strong enough for some water. Yeah, I'll just put a little bit in Yeah, there you go. Just a little bit. Yeah, no, it's good. So probably move. Yeah, we're well, going yeah. to just in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not looking good, right? Is that good enough? A little bit more. Yeah, I thought that's good because you're going to get splashy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What do you want to do? Can you yeah, see me if I, I sit? Yeah, either way. Okay. Whatever makes you comfortable. Huh? So I don't think we've had Stephanie yet either, have we? So, um,. I don't normally get on camera. I'm always behind so, the scenes. Yeah, some of us uh, don't. I don't like being on camera either, but I get forced to, and so you kind of get to a point where you you just get used to it. But I know a lot of our um, staff isn't used to having to be on the camera. And then, so, uh, but part of what I wanted to do with this was to let people get to know the staff a little bit. And a lot of you guys talk to people here all the time, and. I've already had a bunch of people message me and say, oh my god, I see Stephen's name everywhere. I've never seen him. I've never heard him talk. And so um, that's kind of what we're doing here, especially for we have a lot of remote workers. Um, we have a lot of people who volunteer or even work on staff that don't live close. And so this is really awesome for them to be able to get to know people here. And, um, Logan. I've never met Logan in person. Yeah. yeah. And there's actually um, a lot of stores are already selling baby ducks. And so when the stores start selling baby ducks, uh, we get a ton of baby ducks. And we already have been getting dumped um, and surrendered ducks uh, in great volumes already. We have a lot of animals already here looking for homes. Um, these ducks are adoptable, so if you'd rather uh, adopt and not shop uh, and uh, help an animal that needs a home, we have plenty of ducks here. Um, so let's get started with, um, so Stephanie is, um, does 
I, it's hard to say what she does because she does everything. Um, <laughs> some days uh, she's actually out, um, you know, uh, fixing hoses. And uh, I think that's the same for a lot of us where we have multiple jobs. And I don't think we even need this light, really. We all have multiple jobs that we're doing. And um, some days we're corralling animals. Uh, some days we're fixing the hoses or... Um, building cages and there isn't really anybody here that gets away from doing a lot of different things but that stephanie's definitely the top of the list for jack of all trades um but if you're messaging about donations or something like that you're most likely talking to her um obviously sonia is our veterinarian so um if you have any questions for either of them go ahead and um Put them in the chat and we'll we'll read them out as we get them so all right so tell us a little bit about what you what you do stephanie here and you can i'll let you start off well thank you i do a little bit of everything um uh, not one particular item um I handle a lot of the donations. I used to run the auction. Um, if it's broke around here, I try to fix it. Uh, I try to keep everybody happy and, and together. Um, the animals come first for me big time. Um, yeah. so how, how long have you been here? Um, I've been here four years. Four years in April. Um, yeah, it seems like. how long you've been yeah. here, too. I was like, I thought it was a lot longer. <laughs> no, because okay. you've been here on staff for four years, four years in now. March. So you really? got, yeah, you got here a month before me. Oh. Mm -hmm. so I feel like she's always been here. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, she has pretty much she's always been here. Started. I yeah. have. I, yeah, I'm always here. You're always here. I'm always here running around. Um, yeah, there's one other person that we've got here that's been here for four years. So we're kind of like the OGs. Yeah. Like, yeah, well, besides Jennifer, I mean, she's been here forever, so yeah. we wouldn't have this place if it wasn't for her. Yes. Um, but yes, we've been here for four years. Seems like longer. It does. We well, we go. We manage a lot of stuff each day. So. Well, we we have a lot going on here, and I think like I can't ever remember dates. Someone will say, I'll say, oh, that happened last last like three months ago and they'll be like it was three years ago and I'm like you know after a while everything runs together everything runs together and you know we deal with a lot of traumatic experiences we had um I think the first time I met Sonia was during our fire mm -hmm. and we had the fire and she volunteered to come out and help and we had the whole house set up for a triage with a million oxygen machines rolling and it sounded it sounded like a hospital in there just uh, oxygen pumping and um, we um, you know a lot of what we have to deal with here is is, is kind of traumatic in a way um, dealing with that stuff um, but and then you you know up to the present day the avian influenza which I think was probably the worst I, I know the fire was all like one of the worst things I had ever had to deal with um, in my life I think and um, the flu topped that for sure uh, as far as how traumatic I think that was because most of our job is um, you know we can't stop and cry every time something dies you can't go to an emergency room and be a doctor and cry every time someone comes in sick or in pain we we have to um, always put on a brave face and every once in a while there's something that just really kind of breaks us down and I think uh, that was definitely one of them but um, I think with the fire like it was traumatic but it was like one event and, and it, it had a finite end quick. Yeah. and it had yeah. a finite end I mean we we had to triage those birds try to save as many as we could we still lost some within yeah. 24 to 36 hours after but that was it yeah. With flu, we had no idea when that end was in sight, what yeah. we were going to do. So I feel like that was traumatic daily. Yeah, yeah it was very stressful. Just worrying. Just day every in, day out. What's going on? What are we yeah. going to do? The How fear we that go? we were going to bring it in to yeah. some yes. of the other animals or, you know, and it's tough because um, 
you know, I had, I, I think there's a lot of comments on our page about the flu and some of them weren't that nice, but you know, this is a facility where we have, um, at times on this side of the facility, over 200 volunteers and we have 400 volunteers and baby birds and you know, you can train people to do everything possible, but the fact that you have that many volunteers means that one person can make a really tiny mistake and it, uh, it, can, it can be very devastating to us. And so that's kind of the fear you're living under is, is, is every volunteer doing everything possible and, and we make the best effort we can to do that. But some of these uh, things, um, you know, aren't necessarily always preventable. Um, you can do everything you can and a duck with the flu can fly in uh, over, they could be flying over the facility and just and just poop on us and there you go um, that's how other disease gets spread here and I, I'm curious on what your opinion is Sonia because this is something I've been thinking about a lot uh, when I first started the rescue we didn't see pandemics like this we didn't see there, bird flu was there, but um, it was not affecting people like it is now, and uh, we didn't have DBE, we didn't have all these things going around, and it just feels like nowadays we're living under this constant threat of, of these diseases that, like, we, we can't put muscovies out anymore because there's so much, uh, like, DBE in the native wildlife that once, again, a duck could fly over and just poop in our pond, and then we, we have... All this threat of disease, and I, I, I feel like it's somehow tied to like the changing in the weather and all the other stuff going on. I'm kind of wondering what your thoughts on on that are. I, I think there there's multiple points to it. So not only is the world getting smaller, so we think about one person being able to carry any disease, um, viral, bacterial, whatever, from one side of the world to the other, um, in six hours, twelve hours, mm -hmm. anything like that. Um, I was talking to middle schoolers yesterday about becoming a veterinarian and the importance of like USDA food animal diseases or foreign animal diseases. Um, and people don't understand that you don't bring stuff back from other countries that you go to. Um, and they bring stuff back and we can always introduce stuff into our populations. Um, and the rate at which things mutate is, I, I don't, it's not any faster than it was, but I think there are so many more that the chances of mutation are getting greater and greater. So think about, you know, we, during the pandemic, everyone locked down, we didn't get anything. When people started coming out, we had like seven variations of flu. Um, we had every crud and bug that there was, and it just seems like we were mutating it. At my house, you know, one would get it, mutated, give it to me, and I'd mutate it, give it to my husband, my husband would mutate it, give it back to us. And we just kind of keep going around in a circle in a circle. And I feel like it, there's no way that we can fix it or stop it. It's one of those things that we have to look at. It's not only for the animals, but for people. Like, we're just going to have to be better at taking care of ourselves and making sure that our immune systems are as boosted as possible. Um, that's what we try to do with these guys, too, is we try to make sure that they're healthy, they get what they need, they get whatever vitamins and whatever we can, and as much sunshine and outside play and enrichment as we can, because a healthier body is going to be able to do better but you know our biosecurity, everything that everything that that entails, is it ramped up a, a level, but we're never going to go down baseline. We're never going to be like, oh, it's okay. I, I don't think we're going to get this or that. We're always going to have to be at a hyper vigilant level. And you know your clothes, and you don't want to take stuff home to your your own pets. All of that, I think, is is a different mindset that the whole world is going to have to take. Mm -hmm. Not just for animals, but for people, people as well. Yeah. And it's just like when I was just talking about how we have all these volunteers and you get one person that makes a mistake or one person who doesn't want to take the extra step to step in the bleach bath, but it's the same thing on people are that those people yep. that in the world that they're the ones that get caught with like an animal in their luggage or something in their luggage and they've brought in this invasive bug or something like that. But the other thing that I've also think is very alarming is is the rate that we're developing antibiotic resistance. Absolutely. And I know in the, in, I mean, and I've been rehabilitating for such a long time, but when I was trained originally, like this was a long time ago, they said, oh, give everything Batril. Everything was Batril. Um, it was a cure-all for all diseases. And then as, as you learn and you start researching, you realize, well, that's kind of your top gun drug back then. 
you don't want to start with that because you have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. um, but now, like, it's it's actually banned in food um, animals, and um, and so there's so much resistance now to that. And I think there's um, a study I read recently was saying that you know we went like. I can't remember the exact timeline, but it was like 20 years we went before we had a resistance to the first bacteria, uh, antibiotic. Now they will make a drug, and within a few years they're already seeing resistance. So, uh, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? For so, yes, absolutely. So not only do we have superbugs, but as people we tend to create superbugs. So this is kind of to people. When a doctor gives you your antibiotics, take them all of them from beginning to end. Everyone is always saying, oh, I felt better, so I stopped taking it. That's when you're gonna create your superbugs. So if you don't take that full course and kill off that entire population of bacteria that is in your system, those ones that were are left, they'll be like, oh, I remember that drug. Let's go ahead and make ourselves more resistant. Their job in life is to survive. The other thing is ant people do this with animals all the time. So not only animals that I see here, but in private practice too, they're like, oh, we felt so much better after three days. We didn't give the antibiotics anymore, so I have a ton of antibiotics. Um, we can't afford to do that. We have limited antibiotics that are there, and then the problem is, especially on the animal side, these newer antibiotics that may have um, broader spectrums, deeper penetration into cell walls, are going to be ridiculously expensive. So we won't be able to afford the medications that actually are killing the bugs that we need to. Not to mention we don't know what adverse side effects there will be to um, these guys. And they are considered food animals, even though obviously they are our beloved pets. They're not going to get eaten. They're, yeah, not, they they're not going to get eaten. <laughs> they're not in our food chain. No. But even if there's a slight possibility, then, you know, our hands are tied as far as what we can give them that's not, you know, that's still legal. Um, so it's really important that we do things like that. I remember, um, and everyone will remember when they were little, um, and you got sick, yeah. you got amoxicillin, right? Yeah. And it, it smelled like Miss Piggy's pink bananas, <laughs> bubble gum yeah. flavor. It mm -hmm. tasted amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Took care of everything until you were about 12 years old. Yep. And then they, they started start working on other stuff. Yep. Now I see with the younger kids, amoxicillin's not even kicking in anymore. Mm -hmm. So they've changed drug classes. And that's scary. That's scary yeah. to think that we have all these bugs out there um, that we won't be able to treat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that and what you were saying about the affordability of it, because when they do research on a drug, that a ton of money and um, effort goes into developing the drug, and then um, if it only lasts a few years, they have to shift back focusing on developing a new drug. So the costs are astronomical, as yeah. opposed to us having amoxicillin, which lasted 20 years, without them having to do all the research again. So the, that's why the cost of those medications are going up really high. And I don't think, um, I mean, we have so many different medications here that we have to rotate through for different drugs that um, we used to never have to carry all that. And it adds it adds a lot to the expense of the vet care. Absolutely. Um, I mean, and we, we've had to find new ways to use medications. Um, so we were using, somebody asked me what, I had started a patient here um, on eye drops, but into the nares. So sometimes we've done systemic antibiotics, but it's not working, it's not killing it. Um, sometimes I'll actually use an ophthalmic solution and put it into the sinuses because it can be locally absorbed. But those um, ophthalmic solutions can be really expensive. Like, yeah. you know, Oflox is not that bad. Batril is definitely more expensive, or like the Batril Otic that we use in reptiles for mouth lesions. Those are expensive drugs. They work really well. We have to find new new ways to administer them or new things to do. Um, but like when we nebulize, you know, all these animals and we do it with in antibiotics that are inhaled and we're trying to get it into the system, those are expensive. Oh, yeah. um, and it, we can't get rid of the, you know, some of the upper respiratory infections that we had that we used to be able to get rid of, they've mutated. Um, so we have to try a lot more things, and unfortunately for these birds, they're sicker longer because they're not responding to our nuts. Yeah. I've got a few questions from oh, cool. commenters. So Ellen on Facebook wanted to know, what happens to a bird after it hits a window? So we t talk about like stunning birds stunning. with tra tra traumatic brain injuries mm -hmm. and things like that. So there's the acute stunning phase, which you pretty much just are knocked out. 
Um, and then sometimes like by the time you go get a box or something, you're like, oh my gosh, and then it's okay and it's a little bit wobbly. But then we have more of a traumatic brain injury or if we fell into something or it's a little bit harder on the head, um, then we worry about like brain swelling. We have um, clinical signs for that. We'll show like anisocoria, which means our pupils are different sizes. We're kind of not all together there, neurologically speaking. Those guys definitely need to be brought in and have much more care done. So a lot of times we'll do stabiliz stabilizing as, as well as we can. Some of the ones that just kind of are stunned for a little while will come in, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, we take care of them and they're usually easily released. Yeah, that's where like, I, I relate that to like getting the wind knocked out of you. So you can have the wind knocked out of you and then you, yeah. you come around and you see stars for a minute and you're like, okay, what happened and I'm good. But I mean, I've even seen compression fractures, depending on how they hit, where, where it's compressing, yeah. they're, they're hitting straight on and the spine just, you know, kind of uh, compresses down and fractures. And um, you get a lot of coracoid fractures too. Yeah. It really varies on how they hit, hit, how they hit and how hard they hit. Um, but um, we can actually talk a little bit about preventing that too as well maybe later but you had other yeah, questions for her. sure um yeah. somebody asked what has been one of the trickiest cases you've treated or hmm. a common tricky condition that you know is always going to be a little bit tough when it comes in so one that i thought was i'll do a couple so one that i thought was really tough when i first started working i, I went to that school learned everything um there was somebody who was working here and they kept telling me how hardy chickens were and i'm like mm, okay um and it was we were missing about half of the chicken. Let's just say there was no skin, no feathers. Half of this chicken was pretty much missing. And I said, I don't know about this wound, you guys. I, I don't think we're gonna be able to do it. That person looked at me and goes, it's a chicken, it'll heal. And I did not believe, I, I made a bet. I made a bet, I was like, nope, you are wrong. Um, and we ended up with baseball sutures all around, which are kind of these big loopy sutures that we do so that we don't have to wrap the bird multiple times every time we do a wound debridement or cleaning it's a lot um, more peaceful for them and I was completely wrong and this chicken grew regrew half of itself um, I mean entire breast was exposed like heel was exposed and everything and it took about maybe five weeks mm -hmm. well, five wow. weeks to regrow like half of a chicken wow so That's crazy. that was one of them another one we, well, I mean, Charlie was a constant oh. source. Um, so poor and we, Charlie. And I think Charlie, everything we did, we were thinking, we're gonna this do this, but we don't know if it's gonna work. Or we're gonna just keep trying. And we did extend his life. It did, for, we did, for, it worked. We for did. For a good long while. Yeah. And then, then eventually everything we tried stopped working at some point, but. But we got to do cool things like um, sometimes when we have prolapses that kind of keep on coming or not. I don't remember if um, you remember we did the we cut a syringe and we made holes in it. And yeah. I was able to make an artificial vent. Yeah. Um, where everything can come out, but not the suit, the, not the prolapse. Yeah. Um, so that was something that was pretty interesting and pretty cool that we got to do here. Cool. What are some of the really common cases you see that vary depending on the time of year? Um. I mean, it depends on the species too, but obviously, yeah. always, always, always is hit by car trauma or a predator attack or something like that is kind yeah. of what yeah. we see a lot, a lot. unfortunately. Um, and there is a lot of treating just wounds and, and hit by cars and things like that. I will tell you that it makes me really, really sad because people don't know here. I mean, um, where I live, there's. I'm by Sun Valley, you know, there's a thousand geese yeah. that, that make Sun Valley their home. Um, and in front of the daycare, I literally saw someone just hit a, a goose at like 60 miles an hour. Purposely. Didn't even bother. Mm. Like, yeah, it they looked like they were, purposely. They, were they, they, they were targeting it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, half the time, and some people stop, some people don't, some people care, some people don't. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't. Um, but a lot of it is just kind of triaging and that's what we see, especially now, unfortunately, since they're everywhere, um, I would say a lot of traumatic events is what we're seeing, and, you know, injuries that are coming in, fractured bones, um, like road rashes, things like that, fractured beaks, um, and then predator attacks. And again, like what Logan said, I have two cats, yeah. um, keep them inside. 
Yeah. Keep what about the, the duck that we're working on now that has the predator yeah. attack to the face? <clears throat> And, and talk about like the complications with that kind of a, a wound. That one's pretty intense. That 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 one I'm 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 definitely concerned about. So the this poor duck um, has bite wounds on both sides of its face. So obviously something munched on its head, um, munched on the uh, most distal aspect of the of the beak. So the this little part right here, and then we have all of this is exposed, all of it, the whole front, the whole front. Um, the we problem with that, that one that's scarlet yes scarlet so the problem with that is if it was anywhere else on the body and what we're trying to do is grow skin into regular skin and we have any kind of tissue under there we can create granulation tissue we try to get it to if i can't close it um because it's too big what we'll do is we'll let it heal from the um inside out so we let it granulate 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 but right now we have skull exposed i don't have any tissue there the other re the other problem that I'm concerned about is that it's not skin to skin, it's skin to keratin. So when we're talking about the bill, the mm -hmm. bill ends right there and the bill's not going to grow more bill. Right. Um, so we're trying to get... Well, keratin can't grow skin. Yeah. Yeah. And we can't get one to the other and I can't suture any one to the other. So if you try to suture through a bill, you'll rip right through it. So when we talk about regular skin and when we talk about keratin keratinized skin. So keratinized would be like your nails. It's different. Um, it's a different kind of skin. Um, so that one is going to be very challenging. The last time I was here on Thursday, we did debride. And what we do that is we're trying to make it angry. And I know it's going to sound really weird, but when you're healing wounds, you want something to look like raw hamburger meat. And, and I'm not saying this to eat or anything, but think of the consistency of raw hamburger meat. It's things that are bloody and raw want to heal. If it looks like cooked hamburger meat that doesn't that's dead skin it doesn't want to heal so that's why it's important that we get in there we clean out all that stuff that's gray and dark and gross um, and try to get it bloody and fresh and pink because pink wants to heal so a lot of times you know it looks bad but we do make the wound a little bit angry so that it wants to heal um, once it stops or once it turns gray then it, it won't heal anymore so we're gonna have a problem with that but I anticipate between laser debriding we're using something called console putty as kind of a scaffolding. Um, we will use a combination of med honey. Um, and eventually, if we get to the point where we have good granulation tissue, then we do different um, bandage. And you can't bandage because it's on the face. Yeah. So it's really hard to even get some um, tension to bring that skin down. Cool. So as somebody had actually asked, what's an animal in your hospital you can currently tell us about? So you already got that. <laughs> and then there's two more for right now. One is how do you triage an animal? So most important things is like if you're triaging, if, if you have one animal or multiple animals. Okay. So when we talk about triage, you're like, what is most important? That's essentially what you're doing. So like, let's say we have a big, we have five animals on intake. Is everyone standing? Cool. Is everyone breathing? Cool. Um, who's bleeding, who is not breathing, things like that. So those are kind of my list of things to go. Um, I would definitely address anyone who is obtunned or not, or dipsnick, which means they're laterally recumbent or having trouble breathing. Um, bleeding, we can hold on for a second. Like you can always put a pressure wrap on something and come back to it. But something that is having trouble breathing, especially if it's a hit by a car, we wanna make sure that an air sac is not ruptured, um, that something is not going on with some of its pneumatic bones. Um, so you kind of go down your list of things that are most life-threatening to least life-threatening. So obviously something that's not breathing or is completely comatose, that's gonna come first. Then comes our wounds. And even then you're like, mm, okay, I need to suture that one, cool. Let me check if I need to stabilize anything else. If we have a really bad wound, do we also have a break? Um, so you kind of go down the list of things that need immediate attention. So like that. Cool. And then last one for now is, what would you say your biggest challenge is working here? Is it the limp time, resources, the emotional toll? Is there a, a, all of the above? I was going to say, I was say all, all of the above. above. Um, yeah. Honestly, resources are huge. They're huge, but we're really good at making things work. Yeah. Like you'll see on our post that I'm, we use pool noodles all the time. So anytime that we need to boot something, do something, um, like veterinary field in general is very much MacGyvering things because 
yeah. a duck this size is gonna be different from a duck another size or an adult um, and they'll still need a boot or something like that we got to make all of those right yeah. um, so a lot of the stuff is what do we have that we can make things with um, you know we're lucky that our donors have given us a lot of things that we yes. need like our fluid pumps which are gonna be instrumental in hospitalizing animals things like that mm -hmm. um, I think the hardest thing is I mean sometimes you just try and try and try and it doesn't work out and it it's sad but it, it's if it is not the best thing for the animal then that's what we that's must right. do um, and you know burn, it's hard it's hard people spend I don't spend as much time near as much time as everyone else does here and they see it in and out every day and it's hard you really do go through compassion fatigue because you love these guys and you see a lot of cruelty yeah it's a lot of cruelty and um is that what bothers you the most yeah mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah especially uh i remember the three ducks that got purposely hit it was uh, purposely ran over and that we tried to save and they were crying for each other just um mm -hmm. it's hard to see that stuff day in day out and it will eventually take a toll on you or sometimes you have to take breaks and you have to go and find another animal to love on and mm -hmm. kind of yeah i mean that's a really great distract topic you. and i think that's something um it would be good to talk about too because a lot of people um don't realize how hard of a job this is i mean people will say oh you have this easy job where you play with the animals yeah. no. <laughs> and it's emotionally draining anybody that actually knows me uh knows that um you know how how long and hard that I work all the time and um, you know it's not until you get older when you start really feeling more of the effects of the compassion fatigue and you realize that and people told me this when I was younger you can't burn the candle both ends it's gotta burn out and I was always like I ah, know yeah, I'm tough <laughs> you know I can mm -hmm. do it but it does it does wear on you and um, so maybe to talk a little bit Sonia about what are things people can do um, other rehabbers or rescuers um, that uh, what are some things that you do to sort of balance to keep um, from burning out and from letting the stress get to you that was hard yeah that, that, I mean that's a constant struggle I mean that is something that the veterinary profession in general is facing we have one of the highest suicide rates unfortunately um, and it is a lot of burnout a lot of compassion fatigue um, and it and I with the compact we love them like we do and at where I work normally I will fight another doctor for a puppy because I don't get the puppies and I'm like I need a puppy or <laughs> you know you have these cases and, every, and I'm like I need something cute I need something cute and fuzzy and, and something, something to love on I need something now I want something that's not going to try to bite me I want something that's not trying to die on me yes. um, I want please give me something so it's really important Feel that good. It is, you, you need like a feel good one. And one of the things, and I think this is in, in life in general. So um, they've done like neurological studies. Um, negative things are like Velcro, positive yes. things are like Teflon, okay? So something positive happens, it slips right out of your mind. Mm -hmm. A bad thing happens, I mean, I'm sure you can remember something bad that happened in third grade and you still like freak yes. out and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. Um, so, they say for every bad thing that happens you have to remember three positive things we save a lot of animals yeah. we can't i don't i can't say how many i saved i can tell you how many died of, you know on in on my surgery table but i can't tell you how many didn't right and it's because my brain is all of our brains are trained to only look on and the bad. negative yeah. so it's really important that we celebrate small victories it's yeah. really important that we celebrate those numbers, um, those releases, all of those kinds of things because it's good for our soul, it's good for the profession, and I think that's one thing that really helps us to go. Um, I have at work, it's, 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 I called it my perception binder. Um, so anytime anyone has ever given me a thank you card for helping their pets, I put it in this binder. And when I started, it was a little tiny binder, it's like a big binder now. Um, and when I'm having a bad day and I'm like, this sucks, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I'll pull out the perception yeah, binder and go through it. And go through it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Well, Can we get time. a close up on the ducklings before you leave? Anyway, they're all wet. Yes, they've been sitting here. They like their watch. Getting all clean. Which one is the <laughs> All of them. Oh, all of them. All of them. All right. That one. Here we go. Hello.
We got it in each of them. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. So if you're looking for a home, we got them. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you can email adopt at cwrescue.org to learn more. Alright, give us a minute to um, clean up the water and we'll be right back. Grab one? Well, there you go. There you go. Sure. Okay. We're going to just clean up the water. We'll be right back. Oops. Sorry. Oops. Sorry. I'm like, I don't want to throw all the water.